Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this final conference of the EU Interreg Baltic Sea Region Fan Plastic Sea Project. It might sound a bit uh, confusing and difficult, but if to keep it short and simple, we are all here today on this platform to talk about microplastics and what have been done in last three years to reduce the amount of microplastic going into the Baltic Sea. My name is Sandra Kropa and I'll be moderator of today's conference. So I'm happy to be here and today we will have our working day divided in few parts. Uh, in the first part, we will have presentations that will focus on microplastic issues on global, regional, EU scale. So we'll talk about microplastics in general. But the second part will be focusing on pan plastic project initiatives and activities and contributions. Uh, there have been really done a lot in these last three years in terms of research, also communication activities. All of these things you will hear and see. Because at the end of this second session, what will follow after the lunch break, we'll have also a special part of the session uh, dedicated to the communication activities and presentations of them. Also, of course, as all final conferences, we will also have panel discussion in the second part of this day, where we will discuss a lot of interesting questions on global and also regional scale. As also you can imagine, you will have opportunities to ask questions to all our speakers and that will be possible after each presentation. So the only thing you will need to know is that you can write down your questions under this uh, video uh, screen where you just see me right now. So use the opportunity and comment and ask questions to our speakers also after the, each presentation and during the panel discussion. But uh, before maybe we start, let me say a few words. What I, a few words actually about what have been done in these three years and what we'll be talking today about. So the uh, EU Interreg program co-funded project, this um, Fun Plastic Sea project, actually is an initiative that tries to get a lot of data around the Baltic Sea region, actually what kind of microplastic we have all around us, what are the pathways of, uh, of, of these uh, small particles coming into in our environment. And the biggest problem is that uh, all the time we talk about that we don't have enough data and we don't have enough, uh, don't have enough good methods for really common analysis for these microplastics. And in these three years, eight countries, uh, sorry, 11 partners from eight countries worked hard together to get this data. And actually, there are really, really interesting results that will be presented today. So uh, stay tuned and stay with us. So we will all uh, really soon so, uh, hear about them. But um, before uh, we start our working sessions, let me uh, introduce you to our first welcome speaker and uh, have these welcome words from Helcom Executive Secretary, Mr. Rudriger Strempel. Uh, Mr. Strempel has been the Executive Secretary of Helcom since the beginning of this project in 2019 and has huge experience of environmental law policy and diplomacy with a particular focus on international marine conservation. So Mr. Rudriger Strempel, the floor is yours and we really ask you to come and say a few welcome words to this conference. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for having me. I'm very pleased to be here and I'm looking forward to this conference today. And let me begin by telling you a brief anecdote. Let me tell you how I first became aware of the issue of plastics in our sea. Um, this basically dates back to um, about 15 years ago when I was working as a, an observer on a research vessel looking for harbor porpoises in the Baltic Sea. Um, and I can tell you, we uh, plowed the seas of the Baltic for two weeks. We did not see a single harbor porpoise, but we saw countless beach balls. Now, beach balls, of course, are not microplastics, but they can turn into microplastics. And it was at that point in time that I first became aware of the issue of plastics in general in the sea. And that was something that I never quite forgot. But today we're here to talk about microplastics, and that's what I'll do. And uh, as you all know, in the Baltic Sea, Microplastics are a real issue. Microplastics and other micro litter have been detected inside species across the food web and can be found in all parts of the marine environment, on the water surface, within the water column, on the seafloor, and of course also on shore. Unfortunately, these tiny particles are now everywhere. 
Some microplastics found in the sea originate from sea-based activities such as shipping and fishing, for instance, from the abrasion of fishing gear. But the main culprits are on land. Today, we know that microplastics are primarily released to the aquatic environment via sewage waters, untreated storm waters, and snowmelt runoff, all of which are, of course, land-based sources. In particular, our household activities seem to generate large amounts of microplastics. Whenever we do our laundry, microplastics from garments made of synthetic fibers are released into the wastewater system. Our extensive use of microplastic containing cosmetics also contributes. In addition, whenever we use larger plastics, such as plastic bottles and containers, small pieces break off and seep into the environment. Tire and road wear are also important sources. So you can see there's a whole range and a broad range of potential sources. Now, we've made considerable progress on wastewater treatment with most modern treatment plants filtering out between 93 and 99% of microplastics. But due to the sheer concentration of microplastics in wastewater, what sounds like an impressive number at first simply isn't good enough yet. <clears throat> the remaining one to 7% still represent too many particles. What's more, when it comes to stormwater and snowmelt, a lot remains largely untreated or only partially treated and therefore carries large amounts of microplastics as well. Consequently, microplastics will accumulate in the marine environment, just like a dripping tap will eventually fill a bathtub. That's especially true for the Baltic Sea, which is a bit like a bathtub due to the semi-enclosed nature of the sea and the limited water exchange. And therefore microplastics accumulate in the Baltic's marine ecosystem with some particles eventually entering the food web and making the way, their way all the way to our plates. The effects of microplastics aren't fully understood yet, but we already have evidence of some of the risks associated with the ingestion of microplastics by marine organisms. In addition to direct effects, microplastics can also be a vector for other hazardous substances and pathogens that cling to them. Regarding marine species, several studies have shown that microplastics or the chemicals that adhere to them may lead to cancer, liver damage, <clears throat> and reproductive health issues, as well as interfere with hormone function. <clears throat> so clearly, we need to do more. Once microplastics are in the sea, it's pretty much too late. As with other pollutants and hazardous substances emanating from terrestrial activities, we therefore need to act further upstream at the source, so to speak. The outcomes of the Fan Plastic Sea Project have shed some much needed light on the scope of the challenge and the steps we need to take to reduce the microplastics input into the Baltic Sea, especially regarding end of pipe solutions and filtering of stormwater and snowmelt. What is already clear is that the outcomes of the Fan Plastic Sea Project will support the implementation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan or BSAP, which was recently updated in October of this year at our ministerial meeting and is HELCOM's main instrument for achieving our objective of a Baltic Sea in a healthy state. Regarding the issue of marine litter, which also encompasses microplastics, the BSAP contains a clear management objective, which is, and I quote, to prevent generation of waste and its input to the sea, including microplastics, end of quote. The BSAP also contains a concrete measure on microplastics, which is to, and I quote again, agree on core indicators and harmonized monitoring methods to evaluate quantities, composition, distribution, and sources, including riverine input of marine litter, including marine litter by 2022. That's quite a sentence. This is of relevance as it will lead to a better understanding of the microplastics issue at the regional Baltic Sea level. With the BSAP, we'll be continuing in the footsteps of the Pan Plastic Sea project, or at least some of its footsteps. In addition, the Helcom Regional Action Plan on Marine Litter, which was updated along with the BSAP, is the main regional tool for achieving the BSAP's objectives on marine litter and microplastics. It ensures that there are measures in place to address the most common and harmful litter items found in the Baltic Sea region by, again, quote, minimizing inputs of microplastics through measures both at source and through end of pipe solutions, end of quote, and by, and another quote, promoting and actively working for a global agreement to reduce input of marine litter and microplastics. To gain an even better understanding of the microplastic situation in the Baltic Sea, Helcom has launched its Helcom Blues project, which includes a specific activity on microplastics that looks into assessing the status of beach litter in the Baltic Sea 
as well as to produce standard operating procedures, SOPs, for monitoring, monitoring micro litter. The monitoring will cover both the water column and the sediment in order to gain a more holistic perspective of the input of micro litter to the Baltic Sea. So to conclude, the Fan Plastic Sea project and its outcomes have contributed to Helcom work in a very meaningful manner, and I'm particularly grateful for that. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the role of the EU and of Interreg that financed the project and without whom we wouldn't be where we are now. Not only has the Fan Plastic Sea project contributed to closing some of our knowledge gaps regarding the microplastics issue in the Baltic Sea, but it's also left us with a legacy on which to build our future work for a Baltic Sea free of microplastics. Thank you for your attention. I wish all of us a fr very fruitful final project conference. Thank you, Mr. Schrampel, for the, giving this insight into the problem and also your personal experience with uh, observing this plastic pollution problem at the beginning. But there is one more person from Helcom side uh, I would like to ask also to say some welcome words. And Ms. Lillian Bus is chair of Helcom and already for over a decade working on the interface between science and policy in this field. So Ms. Lillian Bus, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Um, I'm happy to say a few welcoming words here. Rüdiger Strempel already highlighted the issue in the Baltic Sea. Um, my name is Lillian Busse and I'm chairing the HELCOM um, for over for two years. I started last year and uh, my period is finished um, June of next year. So one of the major tasks, and Rüdiger already mentioned that, is the update of the Baltic Sea Action Plan or BSAP. And um, Rüdiger also already highlighted what measures are in the new adopted BSAP regarding plastics and microplastics. And also Marta Ruiz from Helcom will later present uh, microplastics in the Helcom framework. However, the subject of plastics and specifically microplastic is near to my heart for many years now. In my other life, beside Helcom, I'm leading the Division of Environmental Health and the Protection of Ecosystem at the German Environment Agency. And within our agency, we address the issue of plastics and microplastics from a lot of different angles. So we look at the status of microplastic, what do we find in the environment, in water, air, and soil. We look at um, monitoring methods. Um, there are different ones, and all of you know that if I look at the coast, at the beaches, or in the water. We also deal with the analytical methods. How do I actually measure microplastics? We also have uh, looked at the different inputs, and Rüdiger also already mentioned that from land and from sea, there are many different pathways how uh, microplastic actually end up in the ocean. And we also looked at some overarching approaching approaches, including, for example, product design. How can I actually design products better? And also looked at uh, communication. Um, for example, how do um, people give plastic also a value, but also a communication to avoid littering? All the divisions uh, within our um, agency actually contributed to a paper that we published last year. Um, we looked at the status. Uh, we've asked ourselves the question, how big is the issue of um, microplastics and plastics? We developed measures but we also identified um, research gaps and knowledge gaps. And now we are slowly implementing um, the measures and advise the decision makers and policy, um, the politicians uh, to take measures. In addition, there was an interest group of the interest group of the EPA network. EPA stands for the Environmental Protection Agencies uh, within Europe. They have a network and within that network they have interest groups and there was an interest group called plastics in the environment and i was leading that group and um, we addressed many different issues but also issues of microplastics and for example of the tire abrasion rudiger also mentioned that as well the tire abrasion we all know it's a big source of microplastics in freshwater systems but also in the ocean and we were talking to the european tire association for example analytical labs, um, wastewater treatment plants, and also the EPA um, or the Environmental Protection Agencies 
Um, so we talked uh, with many different stakeholders within the European community and then developed a thorough paper that we delivered to the European Commission. And maybe lastly, in my former life, I worked for the California Environmental Protection Agency and also in California, plastics and microplastics is big issue as you all can imagine and we had specific projects um, uh, looking and identifying from um, microplastic to microplastic that um, the issue of microplastics and plastics is a very complex one it has to be addressed from many different angles and with many different stakeholders i think there's also still some knowledge and research gaps but I think we can and we need to go ahead and implement measures now. Um, I looked at the agenda. You have agenda, you have a very interesting day ahead of you. Congratulations to the project and I wish you interesting talks and a fruitful discussion today. And with that, I would like to hand it back over to you, Sandra. Thank you. And thank you for this welcome message. But before we start our interesting uh, and inspiring day, what we have in front of us, I would like to also welcome here Ms. Sylvia uh, Migdal from WWF Poland. Uh, Ms. Migdal works at WWF Poland as a marine conservation specialist and she focus of her work concerns uh, marine litter issues, marine biodiversity, wildlife conservation and marine policy. So please Sylvia. We want to hear welcome words also from your side. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sylvia Migdał and I work as a marine conservation specialist at WWF Poland. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to, to learn more about the outcomes and the results of the Fantastic uh, Sea project today during the conference. Actually, I have prepared a couple of slides, so I will try to um, share them right now. Can you see it now? Okay, so um, I will start uh, with uh, our view on the microplastic pollution problem. So basically, we can speak about the microplastic pollution problem in a couple of different ways. And this is uh, what we do as a non-governmental organization in order to somehow raise the awareness of the society on this microplastic pollution problem. So in general, when we want to see a bigger picture of something, uh, the best thing we can do is to zoom out. And this approach and tool have been used in the campaign that we have run in uh, New, Ze New Zealand by WWF. And as a result of this work, we have received some really beautiful photos. So at first glance, when we, when we look at those photos, what we can believe we see in these pictures is a star system. It looks beautiful, it's hauntingly majestic and very inspirational, but with the closer inspection and with the closer look, uh, we can realize that the stars are actually microplastics that, I, that are suspended in the water. So we use those photos to somehow raise awareness among the society on this problem. Those photos are shocking. And with shocking information like this one, people start to grasp the unbelievable scale of the problem of microplastic pollution. And speaking of the scale, uh, those beautiful pictures are the background for some really frightening and really worrying numbers. So uh, recent studies suggest that microplastics in our ocean outnumber stars in our galaxy 500 times. And what we observe in our projects and actions that we run as WWF and any other um, non-governmental organization is that there is a general awareness of microplastic pollution problem among the society, but people are not yet aware of the size of the damage that is being done. And we believe that knowing such numbers helps to understand that we need to act now and that this plastic crisis requires immediate actions. And this is something that we all have to fight for. Another tool uh, for raising awareness among the society is zooming in. So let's say that we all know that microplastic pollution is a global problem, 
but sometimes it's hard to remember about the components that make up this global picture. And first of all, we need to remember that from Mariana Trench to the Mount Everest, there is not a single place on Earth that is untouched by plastic pollution. Plastic pollution affects the natural environment of most species that we know that live on our planet. And there are actually new species being discovered with plastic particles in their bodies, like the Eritanes plasticus, which was found in the Mariana Trench at the depth of 6,500 meters. And last but not least, uh, of course, the microplastic pollution affects every one of us. So this is something that people are not yet aware of and people should become aware of. And to answer the question on how does it affect us, people, every one of us, I would like to show a short movie uh, from one of WWF's campaigns. So how to solve this problem? I think that uh, this question will come up here today many times and it's really great. And I probably, uh, I think that we probably al already have some answers to these questions in case of uh, the, uh, the Baltic Sea. Unfortunately, the current global approach to addressing the plastic crisis is not good enough. Uh, WWF has created a petition where the people of the world ask to create a new global and legally binding UN agreement to stop the leakage of plastic into the oceans by 2030. Uh, we believe that the agreement should set strict goals for pollution reduction in each UN member state and instruct each state on how to meet these goals. But of course, um, today is not only the about the global approach, especially because we are discussing the case of the Baltic Sea. So in case of our region, we believe that it's absolutely crucial to reach the goals from the plans that we have right now. So the HELCOM BSAP, which was updated in October, and the Regional Action Plan on Marine Litter. And to reach the goals of regional plans, we of course need our decision makers to act on the national levels, but also we need regional initiatives and pro projects to gain knowledge, to look for the best uh, solutions. And I'm really happy and I'm really glad that there are initiatives such as the Fun Plastic Sea, which is a great example of a project which is looking for answers to many difficult questions that we are all facing when discussing plastic pollution issue. So I'm really excited and I'm really looking forward to learn uh, more today about the project results and outcomes and I strongly believe that initiatives like this one are the key steps in our fight against the plastic pollution. Thank you so much and have a great conference. Thank you, Sylvia, for your inspiring words and uh, really showing our plastic diet. And uh, the truth is, as you said, and also as video mentioned, that it doesn't disappear, but what to do with this and how to solve this problem, this is the key question also for today's conference. But before we start today's working sessions, I would like to ask also you a few facts about plastic, and that's why we will use a poll question also here in our conference. We'll use it today several times. So let's check out how it works maybe right now. So uh, there is one question I'd like to ask you. How much has the global production of fossil fuel-based plastic increased since the 1950s by the year 2017? So the closest approach to nowadays. So choose one of the options provided. 
uh, let's see how it works and if it works for us really good so vote for the uh, uh, these options uh, either it is uh, by 4 million tons by 30 to 40 million tons or by more than 400 million tons please um, let us know your uh, answers yes so i see the activity is going on let's uh, wait a few seconds as well maybe some other participants want to choose one of these options how do you think how much the global production of uh, plastic increased since 50s so but the tendency we see already and that's right annual global production is primary of primary fossil fuel based the plastic increased from around 2 million tons in 50s uh, uh, to 438 million tons in 2017 so the amount is really really huge and i have also the second question so let's see how good you are in this which of these sectors is the priority user of plastics? Also here we have um, options to choose, either it's electrical, transportation, consumer products, other textile, building and construction or packaging. Um, let's see your point of view here. So choose the options and then let's see how close you are to the statistics what we have. So, um, we are still waiting some of the answers. Feel free to let us know what do you think. Okay, there are many, many options. But okay, I can say the tendency is clear. So um, let's show the, the statistics and the answers. So the packaging, of course, is 36% of um, like the, the priority user of the plastics, the sector is really, really huge. Then we have uh, building and construction, 16%, and then a bit less textiles, other 12. Then the consumer products, 10%, transportation, 7 and electrical, only 4% as these users. So thank you for your activity and taking part in this poll, but we will have a few more in coming sessions and also at the end of the conference. But um, as we already have seen who is using plastic the most and how much in general we have done it since the 50s, let's talk about plastics in um, general and global EU and also Baltic Sea regional scale. And our first working session will focus on these questions. We'll have now four presentation, uh, presentations and after each presentation we'll have five minutes for questions and answers and also your comments. And as I mentioned before, you can write them down here under where you're looking at us right now. So, and the first speaker I would like to invite here is Mr. Peter Kershaw. Uh, he will give us an insight on plus microplastic problem on a global perspective. And Peter is an independent marine environmental consultant based in the United Kingdom, focusing on issues associated with the reducing the impact of marine litter and microplastics as well. So Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sandra. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for in inviting me, e even though, as I explained to the organizers, I'm two hours before you, so it's a little early in the morning for me. So forgive me if I yawn. Um, I also want to thank um, Sylvia. That was an excellent, excellent presentation. And it gave a really good introduction. And uh, I like your idea of zooming in and zooming out. And I'm going to ask you for using one of your photos later, I think. Um, so I, I, my, my epiphany, I'm not sure what's the right word, um, to, to becoming interested in microplastics actually was, um, was not what looking out to see, but was listening to the radio uh, and, and a follow-up article, uh, which was back in 2008. And that kind of inspired me to think this was a, an issue with microplastics, particularly chemicals associated with it at that time. And um, I was very fortunate to um, be in a position where I was invited to join um, a, a, a working group, a, a UN-based working group uh, called GAZAMP, uh, which is, um, GAZAMP is, is the joint group of experts on scientific aspects of marine protection. And it was there that um, I, I raised within GAZAMP um, the issue of, of um, of microplastics for the first time. Um, I, I got to carry on the zooming out theme um, because um, this is a, a map 
uh, and of course it's it's based on 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 on, on models and assumptions so it's not right it, it it's 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 wrong but it's useful and these are relative quantities of microplastics and surface waters um, calculated um, as from from estimates uh, of coastal population density and, and river flows and it's part of a big program called the transboundary waters assessment program if anyone's interested uh, i can uh, give you links to that and you can see that this which is rather based on rather poor data um, I, i'm sure data coming out of fan plastic fan, fan plastic is going to be a great help in, uh, in in looking at this again but you can see that the baltic surely is 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 one of the higher but it's by by no means it's thought to be the the, the most um contaminated with microplastics in the world but it shows that this is a global there's nowhere there's nowhere where it doesn't escape them um so part of the part of the um the international response so gazam gazam was set up uh, over 50 years ago to to support um uh, at the moment it's got um I think it's 10 different United Nations agencies um, and uh, to, to help provide independent uh, yeah, authoritative advice, inter interdisciplinary. It's, it's all done, it's mostly done on a pro bono basis from people around the world. And um, a working group was set up in 2012 uh, specifically to look at, at the issue of microplastics. And uh, this produced two reports you may have you may have come across them um, in, 19, in 2015 and 2016. And the working group is carrying on with, with, with different terms of reference. And I just thought I'd show you the current membership. Uh, we met virtually just uh, about two weeks ago uh, for the first time in this new, new phase of the work. And so you see that we try and be global in our extent because it's a global problem and you need lots of different perspectives uh, to, to deal with it. Um, why won't you move on? Stopped proceeding. Hello, organizers. My screen seems to have. Okay, fine. Um, so the next steps, what we're doing now uh, is creating a risk assessment framework. And the reason for doing that is to support an evidence based decision making process. Um, and, and, and really, and one of the main reasons for doing that is so that we can target measures because we can't do everything at once. Um, so the current terms of reference now are, are to develop risk assessment methods uh, for all types and sizes of, of, of litter and microplastics. Um, and it's to look at the impact on, uh, on, on macro litter. Uh, on human well-being, biodiversity, food security, and so forth, but also the, to try and assess the effects of, of nano-sized and microplastics, um, whether this is to do with the chemical contaminants, the impact on biodiversity, uh, human health, risk perception, uh, risk communication, because it's, it's uh, I mean, WWF Poland has done an excellent job with communication, but it's a difficult, it's a difficult topic. Think to, to put over the general public. And finally, to carry out an initial risk assessment. And this is to cover all, all aspects of social, environmental, uh, and economic uh, impacts. Um, something else, of course, you'll be, I think, very familiar with is the agenda. It should be 2030. I do apologize. I was writing this rather late last night. Um, and the sustainable development goals. And, and you know, 14.1 by 2025, prevent and significantly re reduce marine pollution. And clearly, um, this is where fan plastic has a, 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 a very important um, role, role to play. Um, but I think the point to remember is that gen the, the, the SDG 14.1.1 is, is clearly very important and, and maybe it's the focus for, for fan plastic. But there are a whole range of other SDG goals which are important. Um, and so I just highlighted some of the more obvious ones here. Um, 6.3, proportion of untreated wastewater should be halved. Um, adoption of clean environmentally sound technologies uh, for, for, for more resilient infrastructure. Um, 
making cities and human settlements more sustainable uh, by paying more attention to municipal and other waste management and um, a more overall approach to, to ensuring sustainable consumption and production and the sound management of chemicals and all waste. And there are others, if you look at this on a global scale to do with poverty reduction and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, um, it, it's as well because often um, governments have to make uh, difficult decisions on how to portion monies and so forth and where to put their priorities. And sometimes it may not be the reduction of microplastics in the ocean, which is the, the key concern, but it might be to do with providing some form of wastewater treatment because most of the planet doesn't have it. And that may be for all sorts of other reasons like disease control and, and, and eutrophication. At the same time though, it will have a significant impact on, on, on plastics going into the ocean. Uh, the other thing which I think has, has possibly already been mentioned is through the United Nations Environment Assembly that the major UN um, uh, uh, system really for looking at um, environmental uh, issues on a global scale. Uh, and this came at, at the whole issue of, micro, of, microplastic, of microplastics and marine plastic debris arose at the first uh, UNEA session in 2014. Um, and uh, so, and and for the next four UNEs, um, there were resolutions passed on on marine litter and, and plastics, and and each of them had a, a particular focus. So the in the first meeting it was to produce a study on on marine plastic debris and and, um, uh, and marine microplastics, trying to look at potential policy options and actions. Uh, I was fortunate to be involved in that. Um, the second one was to look at the effectiveness of, of governance mechanisms, because there are governance mechanisms which, which are relevant, but look how effective they are. Uh, at the third one, uh, something called AHEG was convened, and you'll see at the bottom what that stands for. It's an ad hoc open-ended working group, and it's really set up to, to look at um, the, the barriers and options for, for overcoming the barriers, uh, for, for looking at... Uh, all sources, but they at this time they were specifically focused on, on land bases. But of course, it's been expanded to include sea based sources. Um, and also a, a report to look at barriers um, to combating marine litter and microplastics. Uh, at the fourth meeting, it was, this was extended uh, up to UNEA 5, and also a big stock taking exercise um, where, where, where countries were asked to. Um, contribute what their existing actions uh, and activities were. And then another assessment of, but this time of, of the effectiveness of different res response options. So this is all useful material working towards what may become a global plastics agreement, which has already been mentioned. And I'll just give you two um, things of relevance here. Um, uh, one is a ministerial statement um, put out on the, on the second of September this year uh, with a request for endorsements. And I, I, I believe Helcom was one of the organizations uh, which did endorse the statement. And you can read out uh, what it says there. Basically, it's supporting um, uh, the, the, the um, creation of something called an intergovernmental negotiating committee. If anyone has any knowledge about how global agreements and, and um, and, and, and conventions formed. This is the this is the initial step. Uh, and maybe some time before you go from the, this INC to ratification. It may be ten years. It may be longer than that. But that's one of the first steps. And this was Ecuador, Germany, Ghana, and Vietnam. Again, a global endorsement for a global um, problem. And uh, there's also a specific draft resolution uh, on a, on an internationally binding, uh, legally binding instrument. And that's been proposed by governments of Peru and Rwanda. So I think it's important to note here that this isn't um, this isn't just Europe leading the way, which I think would be um, uh, we can always find countries in Europe to push for these sorts of things. But I think it's really important. It's appreciated, and other governments are, are involved in this, and sometimes doing rather better at introducing measures than, than countries in Europe. And if you will, will want to look at those documents uh, in more detail, there's a Link at the bottom if you fail to get that. I'm sure Marta or myself can, can supply.
Okay, so just some final thoughts, really. Um, uh, again, I think you have to ask, what is the justification for improving wastewater collection and treatment? I, you know, again, if you think in a more global scale, it, it may be nothing to do really with microplastics going to the ocean, but the concern may be much more to do with human health or disease prevention or the removal of, of nutrients uh, to, to, um, to reduce eutrophication in coastal water, which is an enormous issue with dead zones. You, you know that in the Baltic Sea, um, but, but are still a huge problem in other parts of the world. And, and uh, or, or just reusing organic matter, all that organic matter going to waste. So how do we reuse it? Well, of course, we, we can separate it off and use get, get sewage sludge and put it on agricultural land. But the question then is, what happens to the microplastics which have been separated off? I'm sure this is a discussion you've had in plastic. So forgive me, but I just wanted to show you just one example. Well, this is from China uh, of the these uh, numbers of plastic particles in in a kilo of dry sludge. We're talking about thirty odd thousand. Um, and so this is another area we we have to be careful um, about not uh, creating a new problem by by solving uh, an older problem. So there, uh, that, that's. Um, that's where I'd like to leave it. I'll leave it with a picture from my nearest um, uh, piece of coastline, not of microplastics, but that material there will, I'm sure, is going to ra rapidly become it. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to take questions if we have time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much. And uh, yes, we are happy to have questions if we, if we have them now here on this um, conference web page where you're looking at us, please. So, so sorry for the technical issue from my side. So uh, do we have a question from Peter? Just a second. Uh, yes, we have a question. Uh, when do you foresee the global agreement to be in force and eventually the process is initiated in UNIA 5.2? Right, very good question. Um, I, I had to do an exercise, um, well, I did an exercise uh, about a year ago. Um, as a preparation for this, I was actually doing some work for the European Commission at the time, and I looked through uh, some uh, other um, conventions and processes. And one of the ones I looked at was the Minamata Convention for Mercury. And everybody agreed that it was needed. There'd been a very long history of it being uh, looked at uh, by, by UNEP and others. And from the start of the uh, the International Negotiation Committee to, to final ratification, I think it was about 10 years. And that was considered really good, okay? If you look at other conventions like the Ballast Water Convention, it, it, was, it was for years you hear, we hope to get agreement by next year. We hope to get agreement by next year. Because for, for the Ballast Water Convention, it needed a certain number of countries and percentage of the shipping tonnage to sign up to it effectively. So, uh, and one of the things with the, the, the Minamata Convention was, which was a lot, of, a lot of effort I think went into, from my knowledge, I wasn't directly involved, was um, looking at the, how to, how to help developing countries or countries, particularly where they have perhaps artisanal gold mining, because that's one of the major, major uses um, uh, of mercury. Um, and so there were financial, there was consideration of technical and financial support. And I suspect to get a global plastics agreement through, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to look at those sorts of issues as well. I mean, it's all very well rich countries saying, yeah, we can, we can, we can improve our wastewater management. We can do things with, you know, uh, with how we treat waste. But then if you wish to get enough countries on board to make it global, then you have to put your, like, yourself in the position of countries who are much less well off, not without um, ingenuity and, and up for the challenge and all the rest of it, but they have competing, they have competing demands of a limited resource. So, I mean, I, can, I, would, say, I would say optimistically um, about 10 years, but I might be just being a curmudgeon and it might happen much, much quicker. 
Uh, well, thank you. We have one more question to you and we have time for that. Otherwise, we will just probably provide questions later. Uh, should we focus on end of pipe or at source solution when it comes to tackling the microplastic issue? This is a question from Robert. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not either or. I mean, it's, it's, it's both and all um, because I mean, it's great when you have systems which like improve wastewater management, but if you can if you can stop it further upstream, clearly there's an advantage. And sometimes it's easier to do that, like with packaging, let's say, or shopping bags and so forth. I mean, Rwanda just banned shopping bags, you know. Um, um, uh, but with microplastics, with multiple sources, if you can't actually control the source very well, then yeah, you have to do both. Thank you very much for your presentation and also answers. Uh, we saw, saw and heard Peter Kershaw. So, I just want to say, Sandra, I forgot to say thank you for introducing me. And, uh, and so I, I do apologize. It's, it's very uh, remiss. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But let's uh, take one step closer now and zoom in to our regional level. Let's talk about the microplastics, about the EU approach of this issue. Mm -hmm. Here I'm happy to invite Mr. Mikhail Papadoyanak to give his presentation. Mikhail has a degree in chemical engineering and has worked in the European Commission on Research, Industrial Policy and Environmental Issues. And within the Environmental Directorate General, he has been dealing mainly with issues of waste management, hazardous substances, international relations and marine environment. So Mikhail, please. Uh, good morning, Sandra. Good morning, everybody. And many thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to intervene in this, uh, in this meeting. Uh, for us, it is very important, not only because we see a project with so many and so good results, but also because we see a project which produces results which are directly relevant for policy making and policy implementation. And you can, you can imagine that this for us, I mean, for EU funded project, this is, a, a, I would say, a legitimate requirement. But it is not always easy, very, very far from that, to achieve, to achieve this link between uh, projects, between research and uh, policy making. Huh? So it takes effort from all sides. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for the introduction, Sandra. Uh, very kind of you. And may I ask uh, Matlina to share the presentation, if possible? Don't worry, it will not be a long presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name, as Sandra kindly explains, Mikhail Papadoyanakis. By the way, thanks very much for pronouncing it so well. Some people find it difficult. Anyway, so I work in the G environment um, and we uh, are in charge of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, and of course, uh, in charge of marine litter from the point of view of marine environment, impacts and assessment in marine environment. Next slide, please. So um, some of you are probably acquainted with the, with the legal framework that we have in the European Union for addressing marine litter uh, generally, and of course, plastic litter and microplastics in particular, um, centerpiece marine strategy framework directed, but of course, a number of other policies contribute directly uh, and are very, very relevant, especially in terms of concrete measures to address specific sources and specific types of, of litter. Next uh, slide, please. Now, we also have uh, with the new commission, uh, the Green Deal. Huh? Um, I assume all of you are acquainted uh, with this uh, and familiar with the main concepts. The Green Deal is directly relevant for plastic litter and microplastics for a number of reasons, um, because of the Circular Economy Action Plan, because of the uh, uh, Zero Pollution Action Plan, and because of the biodiversity strategy, just to name uh, three major pillars of the Green Deal, uh, which have an impact on our work. And I would like to start uh, with uh, the most recent, as uh, I would say, developments. Next slide, please. In the context of the Zero Pollution uh, Action Plan, which was published earlier this year, we have quantitative targets, aspirational, yes, but still quantitative reduction targets for both plastic litter and microplastics. Um, I will not go into details about how we came to this. They are based, uh, they are considered 
ambitious but still feasible if we implement existing policies fully and probably um, adopt and implement other policies which are in the pipeline. Next slide, please. Now, start with a circular economy action plan, which uh, is an updated version of a previous uh, circular economy action plan. Uh, this one, the latest version, um, has a special focus on microplastics. Uh, I will not read, of course, but you can see there are specific measures um, which concern the, the issue of microplastics, including the development of harmonized method, methods for me uh, measuring microplastics in, in seawater. And this is a very important issue. And you will see now uh, in the following slides in more detail how we try to, to fulfill all these commitments. Next slide, please. Now, uh, first, um, use of intentional microplastics. That is to say, microplastics used in products like cosmetics, uh, detergents, and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you most probably know that uh, some countries in the world uh, have already introduced measures for restrictions of, of such microplastics. You have probably heard about the US or, or Australian New Zealand restrictions for cosmetics, which uh, are from, if I remember, 2015 or 2016. But I would like to, uh, to underline that no country in the world has implemented uh, or has considered until now a, a general restriction of microplastics used in products. And this is what we are doing under the chemicals legislation. It's a process that started a few years ago and it is ongoing. Um, you will see that there are several types of uh, restrictions um, or measures, uh, depending on the feasibility, depending on the product use and so on and so forth. And we expect to have the first rest restrictions in place already at the end of 2022. Next slide, please. Now, apart from uh, microplastics intentionally used in products, we have, of course, the microplastics which are generated during uh, the, the life cycle of the product. And uh, the most important sources identified in this category are textiles, um, pre-production plastic pellets, uh, and uh, microplastics from tires, as we heard from earlier speakers as well. Now, for this type of microplastics, they are uh, the measures have been announced in the uh, strategy for plastics in 2018 and in the circular, circular economy action plan that we saw earlier. And more concretely, now we're in the process of um, um, through a study of, of consulting stakeholders uh, and of uh, investigating options, uh, regulatory or other options for reducing these microplastics uh, at the source in principle, but also. Uh, with end of five measures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, thanks uh, very much, Peter, for highlighting the, the importance of uh, wastewater treatment for, for microplastics and not only, I would say for plastic litter more generally, because some people uh, sometimes tend to, uh, to underestimate the importance of, uh, uh, of this uh, source or pathway you can, I mean, can discuss. But still, this is a very important issue, uh, wastewater treatment um, and stormwater management. These uh, issues have not been uh, has, uh, reflected in the uh, wastewater treatment directive until now. It's an old directive which has served its purpose, but needs a review, and this is taking place. And what we do is we're reviewing this uh, directive in connection uh, with the short sludge directive, because as Peter very well explained, there's a direct link in terms of microplastics dissemination between uh, good wastewater treatment and, of course, proper uh, sewage sludge uh, management. Um, so this uh, uh, second uh, point is the, the impact assessment uh, support study that I mentioned earlier for other sources of microplastics. By the way, this is uh, when we're talking about other sources, we are aware of the three major ones, but our study will investigate all possible important source of microplastics and see whether it is uh, necessary to take measures for any of them. So ECA process is the, the, the um, process uh, started in the context of the European Chemical, Chemicals Agency, um, which uh, supports the commission, the management of the, uh, of the um, REACH regulation. And uh, with all this, by the end of next year, we will have a clear view of what we can expect uh, at European level. Next slide, please. 
Now, um, in the beginning, I mentioned that the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is somehow the cornerstone um, uh, of the um, EU policy framework for the protection of the marine environment. If I may put it that way, this is where it all starts and where it all ends. Huh? And there are several activities um, uh, which are directly or indirectly related with microplastics. It's important to note in this uh, context that we, again, for the first time in the world, have a regulatory threshold for beach litter, which was adopted under the Mercedes Framework Directive. And that was done last year. And we have now the threshold of 20 liter items per 100 meters of coastline, macro liter. But this, of course, influences also the, the uh, micro liter concentrations. Uh, now, um, next slide, please. Uh, we are proceeding to um, more difficult issues, if I may put it that way, more difficult than beach litter. And micro litter and microplastics are more difficult because the, the data are not so um, easily available uh, or not they do not exist at all. This is why we have launched in the context of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive a, a vast exercise of data collection. And you can see here the detailed uh, steps. Um, next slide, please. We already have some um, um, baseline for, for microplastics, micro liter and microplastics uh, concentrations in the various environmental media in the, in the EU member states. But of course, we still need more data to, uh, to progress with this work. But the baselines will be, as was the case with beach, beach litter, will be also uh, the starting point for introducing regulatory thresholds also for micro litter and microplastics. Uh, in uh, beaches and, and uh, in the ocean. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I will not um, elaborate a lot on that. Uh, Peter explained very well um, the background and the latest developments. Just to confirm that we, uh, as European Union, strongly support the idea uh, of uh, such a global agreement on plastics. We are aware, of course, of the difficulties. We are aware of the existing um, um, initiatives, the existing frameworks. And in this, um, uh, in this context, we acknowledge and support the role that the regional sea conventions have and will have to play in any uh, such global agreement. And uh, we do hope that the negotiations will be launched in the, uh, the next uh, UNEA. Next slide, please, which is the last one, I think. Yes, this is just to thank you for your attention. And you can find more information about EU policies on litter and microplastics in our website and other relevant websites. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation. We have one question to you as well. Uh, Martin asks, uh, a group of influencers is doing a project called Team Seas, where they try to get plastics out of the ocean. What do you think about this? Do you have an opinion about this kind of activity? Yes, well, it's not only my opinion. It's also, let's say, um, um, a, an outcome. It's, it's common sense, and Peter explained also very well, that prevention comes first, and it's also enshrined in our treaties. But, of course, as Peter also said very well, we might sometimes have both, huh? prevention and abatement at the, at the end of pipe. But not all uh, types of abatement at the uh, end of pipe solutions are the same. Huh? It's one thing to recover microplastics from wastewater, and it's another to go and, and uh, clean the ocean, as some people claim, from, from microplastics. This, I think, is much more difficult and much more debatable. Huh? So uh, end of pipe, yes, in some cases, but only uh, after a uh, thorough examination and only if we are sure that the overall environmental benefit is, is uh, positive. Thank also, you. one short question maybe from Liene. Uh, how all these regulations will be affecting citizens' life, li lives? Do you think the general public is ready to change some of their habits to achieve these ambitious marine litter reduction targets? Um, I think that the public is very much aware uh, of the problem and very much ready to change, uh, to change their, their habits and behavior. But uh, we also need to, to assume our responsibilities and stimulate changes at the production and the product level. And this the consumer cannot do. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail, very much. And we will still have you on this panel discussion, what we'll have after lunch break. Uh, so 
Thank you for all your question uh, answers and also your presentation. As already Mikhail mentioned that reliable results is something that really, really policymakers need to have. And I think Helcom can really explain and tell us why it is so important to have these results, what this project already, projects already showed. And that's why our next two speakers actually will be from Helcom side. Now I would like to ask uh, Marta Ruiz from Helcom part. Uh, tell us more about this uh, health home perspective on microplastics. Martha is Associate Professional Secretary at the Health home, working on marine litter, and her work is to provide support on monitoring and assessment issues, as well as on the follow-up of the implementation of the Health home Regional Action Plan on marine litter. So, Martha, we are ready to listen to you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I will try to share my screen. Um, sorry. Yep, it's coming in full mode. Yes. So, um, as uh, Sandra can mentioned, my name is Mark Reed, and um, I would like to try to show you today what we are trying to do in the frame of, uh, of ELCOM, not only on microplastics, but also on marine litter as a whole. So, we are working on, on three big uh, streams of work, monitoring and assessment, access on sources, and um, I would like also to point out 2021st, because this has been a very important year for, for us. So when it comes to monitoring and assessment, uh, we know what type of litter items we have on our beaches. And as you can see in the, in the graph here, we have a lot of plastics in our beaches. Over 70% of it, of the material that we find in our beaches is plastics. We have also identified uh, the amount in a, in a more uh, specific way for all the, uh, all the places that countries are monitoring nationally as, as part of their national monitoring programs. And you can have uh, uh, this in this slide, a view of what it is out there. We also have been able to identify which are the uh, most commonly uh, found items in the, in the beaches. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we again have plastics uh, among the, the top litter items. And it's also uh, important to point out that um, most of the items reflects our bad habits that when we go to the beach, we don't take back everything that we brought there with us. So there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, room for improvement on our um, habits. There is also information about the seafloor litter items that we have found um, in the Baltic Sea area. Um, we know as well that um, there are differences if you consider number of items or weight when it comes to reporting. This information comes from a fishing trolling nets and uh, that in addition to, com to, compile infor to compile information of uh, fish activities, they also collect information of litter items found. And again, uh, plastic is the, the litter type material that is, uh, is most present in all uh, the subdivisions. Now, when it comes to micro litter, we don't have, unfortunately, that much information. Uh, as, uh, as part of the holistic assessment, the second one that we did in, in Alcom, but we do know something. Uh, we know which studies have been conducted. We know uh, where we were uh, expecting uh, more studies to come. And this has been the basis of the work that has been concluded, uh, conducted sorry, in the frame of the Fan Plastic C project that uh, my colleague Marlena will introduce at a later stage. Then the future is here. So we are currently working in terms of monitoring and assessment on the development of the third holistic assessment of the Baltic Sea. And for that purpose, we will compile data from 2016, 2021. And uh, I would like to point out now what we, are, uh, what we want to have uh, for seafloor litter. Uh, as already indicated, we will use data from a coordinated troll surveys. And this is a database hosted by ISIS. So we will utilize that information in the image uh, you will see uh, how is the status of this trolling. Uh, as you can see, there is part uh, of the Baltic Sea that is not covered because uh, trolling is not conducted in that areas. 
Uh, we aim to have an interinterest hold value, but it is still a pending decision of the heads of delegation, which are to meet next week, and they will be tackling among other issues, uh, this one. And we will also uh, want to have uh, information on single-use plastic and fishing gear items categories separately as part of the assessment, depending on the, on the data availability. When it, comes for, uh, when it comes to beach litter, we will have the threshold value uh, that EU uh, has also established. So uh, there is a lot of coordination in this regard with the work that EU is conducting in this matter. And we want to have a big 20 liter items per 100 meters uh, of coastline as threshold value. And uh, we would also like to try to, to provide data and supplementary information on the, on the top liter items per region. Um, and also on the reduction targets for specific liter items in connection with the reduction targets for marine meter that has been, uh, have been recently adopted as part of the 2021 Baltic Sea Action Plan. Um, also on microliter, um, we will work, we are working towards the development of an indicator for microliter in seabed sediments and in the water column, as well as producing a standard operation procedure uh, for monitoring microliter. As has been already indicated for, by previous speakers, the work on microliter is not so advanced as with uh, beach litter or simpler litter. And um, the work with beach on beach litter and microliter is conducted in the frame of the Alcombus project, more specifically on the activity three, which aims to support on, uh, for, a, for a harmonization of regional work on the description 10 of the MSFE, which is of course marine litter. Now, when it comes to actions on sources, um, in, 2000, in 2015, uh, we adopted the Regional Action Plan on Marine Litter, uh, which deals with uh, regional actions as well as voluntary actions. And it has been um, put forward through the lead country approach and facilitated by the work of the Elcon Expo Network on Marine Litter. And in the, in the recommendation of the action plan, it's already foreseen that if needed, um, the plan would be reviewed in 2021. Also at um, regional level, uh, we have been called, we have uh, at global level, apologies, we have been working um, uh, trying to support what is happening at the United Nations level with, uh, with several, sorry, here, with uh, contributing to several of the, of the United Nations reports that uh, Peter was mentioning earlier today. Uh, as well as uh, trying to, to, uh, to also communicate on the campaigns that the uh, UNEA has been promoting. And also together with other regional sea conventions, we have been uh, involved in the G7, uh, G7 action plan on marine litter. And um, uh, we have already supported them uh, as part of the Ministerial Conference on Marine Litter and Plastic Pollution, uh, the global um, plastic um, regional framework. And as already indicated, 2021 is a crucial year for us. We have uh, the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which has, which has been recently adopted in October. And as part of this Baltic Sea Action Plan, we have for the first time a dedicated section to, to marine litter, which is also linked to the hazardous substance in the, in the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And as you can see, we will have we have already sorry um, objectives on marine litter, which want to be which are uh, ecological as well as uh, managerial objectives. So we want uh, from the from the ecological perspective that there is no harm to marine life from litter, and from the management perspective, we want to prevent generation of waste and its input to the sea, including microplastics, as well as significantly reduce the amounts of litter on shorelines and in the sea. And to achieve uh, these objectives, we have uh, uh, two actions in the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which you can read out here. But it's very important to note that um, the implementation of this and the achievement of these ecological and management objectives is, is foreseen to be conducted through the implementation of the Regional Action Plan for Marine Litter. It's also worth noting that when it comes to reduction targets, we already have in the we also have in the 2021 uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan these uh, ambitious uh, objectives. We want to have by 2025 to reduce the marine litter on our beaches by at least 30%, and by 2030 by 50% from the baseline's total abundance of 40 litre items per 
100 meter of beaches. Also by 2023, we would like to further work and develop regional coordinated quantitative production targets for money in nature so that we are able to guide progress towards relevant regional and EU threshold values. You can find the whole BATIC Sea Action Plan in the link provided here. So as already indicated, the, marine, the Regional Action Plan on Marine Litter is a crucial tool to uh, achieve these objectives. And therefore, we have uh, been working uh, since 2020 and we have concluded on the process of this revision just now, also in, in October 2021, and we have a brand new revised Regional Action Plan on Marine Litter. Um, it's important to note that we will not have voluntary national actions now because countries have decided that the, it is crucial to work on a regional level and it's crucial to work all together. So we just have regional actions. Um, we have uh, 14 actions uh, addressing land resources and we have 15 actions addressing sea resources. And uh, raising awareness is, uh, is included uh, in both sections. There is because due to its importance, it's considered that there is it's better to have included them in uh, when addressing a specific sources rather than, than having a, a specific section dedicated to raising awareness. I will not go into details of the of the all the, the actions, but I would just like to point out that uh, the actions are grouped uh, addressing land based sources, a group on waste prevention and management, also on microplastics, and eventually on single use plastics. When it comes to sea based sources of marine litter, we have only two categories one related to shipping related activities, and another one on abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear, and other fisheries related litter. If you allow me, I will just focus a little bit on the actions that we have on microplastics in the, in the new regional action plan on marine litter. So we have three uh, important actions based on evaluations of the most significant products and processes that release my primary and secondary microplastics. We want to assess if they are covered or not by the current legislation. And if it is not, then we want to influence or adjust the legal framework or identify other necessary measures that are needed to reduce the emissions to the aquatic environment. We would also work on the evaluation of the possibility to introduce regional recommendations to reduce release of microplastics from wastewater treatment facilities. And we will also want to develop a health and guidelines on the establishment of an operation of artificial jobs to prevent plastic losses. So as you can see, we have quite a lot of work ahead. So and with this, I would just like to thank you for your attention and hand over to Sandra. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marta. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, all the two speakers, Martha and next speaker, we have from Helcom side. So maybe if there are more questions, uh, then maybe we can take them also together because for a while I don't see the questions to Martha. So if there are any, please write them right now and send them right now. Uh, but it seems that uh, we go further and we move to our next speaker. And next speaker will be also, I uh, mentioned, Matlena Wala from uh, Helcom side because Helcom has worked very hard and really close to the Fun Plastic project. And Madlena will um, tell us more about this project also from this regional perspective. And uh, please, Madlena, if you hear me, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the um, introduction. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> I'm I'm Matlena Wall, and I've been working as a, a project coordinator um, from Helcom side for the Fun Plastic Sea uh, project, and I'm trying to yeah have the presentation here. Yes, here we go. So uh, thank you for all the all the speakers. Uh, it has been really interesting to hear the global um, EU and Baltic Sea uh, region. Uh, perspectives on 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 this issue, and now we are finally going to the 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 Pond Plastic Sea uh, project, and I'm planning to give you an introduction of it. So the Pond Plastic Sea project, uh, the original name um, is actually um, initiatives to remove microplastics before they enter the uh, sea, and the implementation period. Um, um has been from January 2019 to December 2021. And the project was actually granted with a uh, prolongation due to 
due to difficulties caused by COVID-19. So it, it, it got a six months um, uh, prolongation and that's why it's now ending now in December 21 instead of uh, June uh, 21. And the um, project uh, budget, uh, total budget is, um, is almost 3 million euros with co-financing uh, by the EU Interreg uh, program. And I think uh, here I could take the opportunity to thank um, uh, EU uh, for, for this funding and making this all uh, uh, possible. And then the Fund for Six C project um, aims Um, so the project aims are um, to increase knowledge of where microplastics uh, come from and their uh, transport uh, pathways. And another aim has been to evaluate technology that can reduce microplastic plastic, uh, leakages um, to water causes. And then also to increase knowledge and commitment of decision makers to implement uh, solutions. And there are um, 11 partners in the project in eight different Baltic Sea coastal countries. And the lead partner, the coordinator partner is Sweden Water Research. But then we have Alborg University. We have Finland, uh, Resource, Finland Natural uh, Resources Institute. Uh, we have Latvian Institute of Aquatic Ecology. And then we have uh, CLO Chamber Chambers of Commerce, Industry and Crafts. And from Norway, we have South Lofoten. And from Poland, we have two partners, Gdansk Water Utilities and Gdansk Water Limited. And then we have um, Environmental Center Ekat Kalingrad uh, from Russia and Lula University of Technology from Sweden. And then us, Helcom, the Marine uh, Protection uh, Commission. And I could quickly go through the, 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 the activities in the project. And here you can see the, the work packages. So there are um, four work packages in the project. And then the, the first one uh, was concentrating on administration. And then the second one um, was a systems perspective on microplastic pollution led by Alborg University. And here we have the mapping of uh, microplastic flows and pathways um, where a lot of um, sampling activities were conducted. And then also we have the um, work package three, uh, which was concentrating on microplastic removal technologies. And that was led, that was led by uh, Natural Resources Institute, uh, Finland, Luca. And uh, it concentrated on, on the removal uh, technologies. Uh, the first part was uh, there were some uh, literature reviews and reports conducted. And then there, were, uh, there was also some sampling and, and also these four pilot installations uh, included. And then the work package four uh, was more about capacity building. And there were, um, for example, a lot of uh, public awareness raising activities uh, done within that uh, package. And then we have the, the, the project uh, outputs. So basically in short, um, one output was a microplastic flow model to understand and visualize microplastic pathways. And then we have the, uh, the, the pilot projects or the pilot installations to remove microplastics from storm and wastewater um, that I ju uh, just uh, mentioned about. And then defining innovative governance frameworks as well as dissemination of project uh, results. And then there was uh, some uh, uh, reports uh, published and, and one of uh, Helcom uh, main Helcom's main task was to conduct a, a review of existing policies and research related to, to microplastics. And, and this uh, report establishes a comprehensive baseline on the existing policies related to microplastics on, on global, Baltic Sea, EU, and um, national uh, levels. And 
the report also showcases uh, some of the existing research on, on microplastics at, at these same levels. And there's also a summary for policymakers available, and that was translated into Polish, Russian, Lithuanian, uh, and Latvian. And all these can be found on the um, uh, project and Helcom uh, websites. And, and one of the most important outputs uh, of the project uh, was this mapping of microplastic flows and pathways conducted by Alborg uh, University. And their um, sampling activities were performed in different places, uh, example, rivers, lakes, road runoff, uh, wastewater plant and artificial uh, turf and a um, pumping system equipped with 10 micrometer filters filter was used and and also the, the 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 samples were prepared according to a harmonized protocol and microplastics down to 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 11 micrometer in size were able to uh were, were detected and i think this is the, like the the, the most unique thing about the project to have this harmonized um, um, data set. And then another uh, main uh, output of the project is the microplastic flow model in a um, hypothetical city. And the idea of this is, is to visualize, to understand, visualize and com communicate the sources, pathways and recipients of, of microplastics in the in an urban environment and we will hear more about this on the session two as well as the, the previous uh, activities um, and then then we had in board packets uh, three uh, we had uh, these reports uh, conducted by by Luca uh, on microplastic removal technologies so there was example one on, on, on traffic microplastics, uh, solutions to mitigate the problem, and then uh, existing and emerging technologies for microplastics removal. And Helcom has prepared summary outputs of these reports, and then the Helcom policy briefs are in the, in the process. And then here are the, the the pilot installations, the four pilots that we had, uh, I mean, here you can see um, uh, Lucas pilot installations. So there was one uh, of removing microplastics from urban snow by natural common weed filter. Uh, and that was, uh, that's in, in, in Kokkola area. And then, uh, no, sorry, in Kogola area. <laughs> and then uh, there's one on urban snow melting and purification pilot. Um, which is developed by a, a, a startup uh, called Clevat, and there is no treatment system. And then there are two pilots in uh, Poland, um, which are which have been uh, uh, piloting the um, how artificial wetlands can remove microplastics from uh, both from wastewater and then also from uh, storm water. And then as part of the, the, the capacity building activities, there are many fact sheets uh, have been produced in the project and they can also be found in the Fine Plastic C website. And there they are about the, 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 the pilot uh, installations, but also of, of other uh, topics as well. And then the, the partners have conducted a wide variety of awareness raising activities. Uh, there have been these cleanup uh, campaigns among school children, uh, exhibitions, um, et cetera, and even a board uh, game was developed. But you will hear more about these at the end of the uh, conference. There's a section for that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also would like to uh thank all the partners for for the cooperation and 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 all the speakers for participating uh, the event and i think now it will be time to to give the floor 
to other project partners to, to present their um, results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madlena. Actually, yeah, you gave really good presentation for the next session already because after the short comfort break, we have really a lot of presentations coming. And uh, these will be how already Madlena said about the technical these installations, what you already showed and what was done in during this project, also scientific research, communication activities as well to raise awareness and that will follow at the end of this conference. Uh, but yeah, after the short break, we'll see how the Baltic Sea city looks like from the microplastic perspective. If we look at this from that side, we still do not have questions to you or to Marta at the moment, but I think if something will come up, we will let you know. And now maybe it's time to have a small comfort break and it will be then uh, 20 minutes, not 15, because we are a bit five minutes ahead of schedule. But let's start our uh, second session on time. Then it means 11.45 if it's Eastern European time zone. So see you then. Thank you. Welcome back to the second part of today's conference. And the second session is starting right now. Uh, this will be part, as I mentioned already before, uh, dedicated to the Fun Plastic Project contribution. And uh, we will hear really a lot about the research that has been done. And also we'll see some technical solutions that also will be presented. And at the end of this uh, session, we will have a panel discussion and a specific part of the session dedicated to your communication activities. But panel discussion and this communication part we will have after the lunch break. So till the lunch break, we still have one and a half hour, where we will uh, hear really a lot and see really interesting things. But before we start our presentations, let me again ask you a few questions. And that's why we have prepared very interesting things in our poll question. Uh, the first question will be about the microplastics and its source. So how do you think? Which is the main input of microplastics to the marine environment? You need to just choose one of the following answers. Either it's primary microplastics or secondary microplastics. So it's not very hard to probably choose when it's only two options. So let us know what do you think and what's your activity. Uh, let's see it on the screen. So either it's primary or secondary. So yes, actually you are completely right. Uh, the second answer is correct. Between 69 and 81% of microplastics in the marine environment comes from secondary microplastics that originate from degradation of larger plastics and larger particles. So uh, can we have the second question? So the second question also will be about the source of microplastics. And uh, if we already know that fragmentation of larger plastic items is source of um, microplastics that comes into the ocean, uh, which are the main sources in the oceans besides this uh, fragmentation of larger plastic items? And there you have more options to choose either plastic pellets, personal care products, marine coating, road making, city dust, which is a very, very interesting thing, tire dust, synthetic uh, textiles, please choose. And then we can see after a few seconds, maybe the right answer, which will be actually appearing also on the screen. So we can see the majority, uh, what things, and yes, here is the answer. So I don't know if you can see very clearly, but um, the synthetic fiber is um, actually uh, responsible for 35% of uh, this uh, plastic that comes into the ocean, car tires, 28%, and city dust, almost the same, 24%, and then much less we have actually from road markings and others. And what is interesting that by others, we find marine coatings, personal care products, and plastic pellets. So uh, here are the results. Thank you for voting and thank you for taking part in this question there. Uh, so far we have heard about the sources that um, we have when plastic enters the ocean, but what do we know about the pathways, uh, what microplastic have in the Baltic Sea? Uh, we will have the first presentation about these issues, and that's why we will hear it from Claudia Lawrence and Elvis Vianello from Aalborg University. 
they will know uh, tell us uh, how much we know about it and what do we know about it. Claudia is working as a postdoc in the section of civil and environmental engineering at Alborg University and is uh, Alvis is associate professor at the department of the built environment section also of civil and environmental engineering of Alborg University. Both have been working in fun plastic projects since the beginning. So, Claudia and Alvis, the floor is yours, and we are really looking forward to hear from you what you have found out about the pathways and what do we know about microplastics entering the Baltic Sea. Thank you, Sandra, for this kind introduction. I, I hope you can hear us well. And um, then I will uh, start sharing my um, the presentation. Ah, oh. yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for this uh, technical issues. Okay, I hope you can see the presentation now, uh, which is also more important than seeing me. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, thank you uh, very much for um, have, for having us on this uh, final conference on the EU Interreg from Plastic Sea Project. It's uh, our our pleasure, and. Um, as uh, Madlena already kindly introduced, uh, we at Albo University were working mainly on the on the flows and inputs into uh, the Baltic Sea and to um, um, facilitate uh, the sampling and uh, sample preparation and uh, analysis of um, um, microplastics in the environment. And um, what I would like to um, show you today are some of the results and um, in the context of, yeah, what do we know about entry points, pathways and recipients of microplastics in the Baltic Sea. And uh, first, just like as a quick uh, reminder, since we kind of already uh, mentioned that today, like in the morning of this, uh, set in, of this conference, um, that uh, the different uh, plastic types are um, produced in different sectors and that the different sectors contribute, contribute to different, uh, um, different parts um, to, um, to the plastic demand. So um, for example, as has been mentioned, packaging um, is a, um, yeah, one of the leading sectors in the, in the plastic demand. So with almost 40% and um, these are mainly um, polyethylene and polypropylene that are contributing to this um, packaging, uh, but also polyethylene terphthalate, known as PET, a uh, form of polyester. Um, but as you can also see in this nice infographic is that all the different polymer types are part of, the, of different uh, sectors, also in construction or uh, um, automotive industry. Yes. Uh, in PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. I should share. I'm. No, no, uh, no, no. Yeah, it, it is fine. I, I will just uh, share again. Maybe I um, choose the wrong. Is it now working? Uh, the screen. No, no. Uh, one moment. Uh, I am very. 
No. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm. I had like to make like some very last minute. Um, so I will just share my 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 desktop instead. I'm very sorry. Ah. Okay, but but now it's the not the presentation mode. Sorry. Why? But not the slide. But the slideshow should should work now. Let's go. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, again, I'm very sorry for this interruption. So um, as I pointed out, the uh, um, maybe I move this away. So, <laughs> um, so packaging and uh, uh, is like one of the major contributing sectors and um, polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, polymer types that are associated with that. And also as a short um, kind of recap, since we're talking about entry points uh, of plastics into the marine environment, um, of course, there are one for one also sea based uh, sea based sources, um, but these are contributing um, to a lesser extent. Um, it has been estimated that up to 80% of the microplastics are introduced by, by land-based input. And there, there are, of course, several um, sources um, to mention that need to be investigated. There are constructing, constructing industries. Uh, traffic, as has been pointed out already, is one, uh, one big uh, entry point with the tire uh, wear and tear and also the uh, road markings. Uh, but also the domestic sector with the washing of the synthetic clothes, um, agriculture, because like several foils are used or uh, sewage sludge uh, can be used as a fertilizer, uh, and also the sewage treatment plants, which have been men mentioned, um, there, um, because still a small percentage of the microbes can also escape the treatment. And then there's also um, airborne um, um, pollution. So these are like the several entry points uh, that need to be con considered. And uh, we did that for, for the study area that we investigated, um, the Greater Baltic Sea uh, area, and focusing, we were focusing on one atmospheric deposition um, where we looked at some pristine lakes to assess like the background um, um, contamination with microplastics as well as um, collect, we collected rain uh, <clears throat> and also urban snow. And then uh, other point sources uh, that we targeted were stormwater, um, diffusive and point sources of stormwater. So we looked at aggregated stormwater um, and also uh, stormwater ponds and road runoffs and also waste soil treatment plants as a point source. And then, um, we also had a look at, at rivers, at the pathways into the Baltic Sea. And uh, if I say we, then I mean the whole consortium, um, because like all the, the project partners in this uh, Fan Plastic Sea project were contributing to, uh, to the sampling activities. Um, so as Matilda mentioned already, we um, at AU, we provided a, um, a sampling device um, made out of uh, stainless steel and filtering device uh, that could uh, filter uh, water and um, filter out microplastics um, larger than 10 micrometer. And this equipment was shipped around to, the, uh, to the, our various project partners and uh, they were in sampling in different places, as you see different rivers, um, um, ponds and uh, wastewater treat treatment facilities. <clears throat> and then um, the samples were prepared in also some, some of the, the labs. Uh, and then we received the, the samples for analysis, and there we uh, used some combination of uh, 
techniques of uh, spectroscopic techniques to analyze for microplastics um, larger than 10 micrometer and um, chromatographic uh, techniques to analyze for the car tire rubber. So um, <clears throat> uh, now we would like to present some of these uh, results. So first, uh, atmospheric um, deposition. So as you can see, the pristine lakes have like very low microplastic concentration. Um, um, while in, in the collected rain, we found uh, microplastics uh, on average like 900 um, particles per cubic meter. And then in the, the urban snow, uh, the microplastic concentration was uh, one order of magnitude higher, 6,000 particles per cubic meter. And we saw also like quite a bit of uh, a range between the samples. And um, interestingly, um, a few years ago, um, Bergman et al. They reported even much higher numbers uh, for European snow uh, with several hundred uh, um, thousand particles per liter even, um, so even higher than that. Um, and uh, generally, we saw that the atmospheric deposition is um, rather low concentration and also um, not so many different polymer types, um, except for like the, the urban snow where we saw next to polypropylene, which was uh, clearly dominating and poly polyester also some um, polyurethanes and paints. Um. <clears throat> Moving on to the, the stormwater, um, there we looked into two different aspects. So one was aggregated stormwater, which was collected in Sweden and uh, Poland. And the other one was uh, road related runoffs um, uh, in uh, Sweden. And um, here we see that the average microplastic concentration in the aggregated stormwater were around several thousand particles per cubic meter. And when we look directly into the road related runoff for, for parking lots and uh, road highways, we found uh, several magnitudes higher um, microplastic concentrations of um, 600,000 or 4 million microplastics per cubic meter. And um, the polymer diversity was uh, much higher compared to, for example, the atmospheric deposition, um, but clearly dominated um, by polypropylene. Um, we found also polyethylene and then polyester. Um, and considering concerning the, the concentrations uh, that we found, it um, has been also reported um, by a colleague of us, uh, you et al, that um, these concentrations of like hundreds to thousand, uh, ten thousands of particles per cubic meter are what we find in, in, in stormwater, uh, aggregated stormwater and stormwater ponds in the water phase. <clears throat> so another one of the, the, the point sources investigated was the wastewater. And here we looked for one at uh, raw wastewater uh, as the main source, uh, and then uh, also at the outlets of wastewater treatment plants, so at the treated wastewater. And what we clearly see here is that the average concentration of uh, the raw wastewater was with uh, three, uh, on average, three million uh, particles per microplastics per cubic meter, several orders of magnitude higher than in the treated um, wastewater, where we found several thousands to tens of thousands uh, microplastics per cubic meter. And uh, this ratio is also something that we, we saw in a, um, in a study that was conducted here in Denmark, um, where we also saw like an order of like two orders of magnitude difference between the treated and the untreated um, wastewater. And interestingly, the um, the polymer composition of these raw and also the treated wastewater was more dominated by polyester and, and also mainly in the forms of fibers. Um, but we also find high proportions of polyethylene and uh, polyurethanes. <clears throat> um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, we also investigated rivers as the pathways uh, into the Baltic Sea. Um, so we had several rivers investigated that were um, entering into the, the Baltic Sea in Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. 
and also one uh, in uh, Norway, uh, which was close to artificial turfs. And um, here we can see that um, the, um, all these, um, these rivers were um, had like a, were kind of more like similar um, microplastic concentrations on average were several hundred to th several thousand uh, microplastics per cubic meter. And that we had slightly higher um, concentrations in the rivers that were in industrial and urban areas than compared to rural areas. Um, and uh, again, there are some studies that um, con uh, investigated some rivers that are discharging into the North Sea, and they found also um, similar concentrations of uh, 20 to um, 10,000 particles per cubic meter. Um, and here for the rivers, um, the, the polymer uh, diversity was also quite, quite high and um, was mainly dominated by polypropylene and polyester, um, but there are also polyamides and uh, some, for example, nylon and uh, polyurethanes um, could be found. And interestingly, also cellulose um, acetate, which is, um, for example, used in uh, cigarette butts. Um, so generally, the, 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 the proportions were, um, were quite high of different polymer types for these rivers. And uh, yeah, last but not least, we also uh, were interested in the contribution of car tire uh, in these uh, urban environments. So we looked into um, the car tires and contribution, the tire wear particles in urban snow, uh, in, in rivers, uh, the one specifically that was close to artificial turf, and then in various storm water sources. Um, and here we saw that um, the average concentrations of uh, tire wear particles was quite low in or next to zero in treated snow. And uh, also in the rivers close to artificial turfs, it was very low and also in treated stormwater and more uh, slightly elevated in the, the urban snow collected uh, with uh, thousands uh, of part microgram per liter and in, uh, also in stormwater. But when we look into the, the road runoff directly, then we see um, on around 1,000 times higher um, concentrations of um, of, 8, 000, uh, of 800 milligrams of uh, tire wear particles per liter. Um, and also the accumulated uh, tire wear particles in the stormwater ponds that uh, we analyzed um, had quite a high range from zero to, um, to 230 um, milligrams of, um, of tire wear particles per gram of sediment, so quite high. And um, there was a study in 2013 by Mietze and Adal, and uh, they reported also a similar range um, of uh, tire wear particles in different urban river sediments. So um, general conclusions we can, we can draw from, from, from these studies are that um, samples that are related to atmospheric deposition show a low microplastics concentration, but we still find uh, microplastics even there in pristine lakes and um, that the microplastic types where uh, only a few could be find, found and that uh, in urban snow, uh, both the microplastic concentration and the diversity of polymer types is uh, higher. Uh, samples related to stormwater uh, were clearly dominated by polypropylene, um, uh, especially in the, and were also highest in road related runoffs uh, with um, hundreds of thousand to millions of particles per cubic meter. And, um, uh, in the outlets of wastewater treatment plants, we saw a significantly lower microplastic concentration than in the raw wastewater, um, which shows that uh, the, the treatment of the of wastewater is quite efficient. Um, but there is also still like an emission from these wastewater treatment plants. And um, both the raw and the treated wastewater was dominated by polyester. Um, 
when we look at the uh, several rivers that are discharging into the Baltic Sea, we found similar con microplastic concentrations as for some rivers that are discharging into the North Sea. And uh, samples that are related to rivers contain a high diversity of, uh, of different polymer types. And among these is, for example, cellulose acetate. Um, overall, all these samples we investigated, we found that polypropylene, polyester, and polyethylene, where the, which are also mainly used for packaging, were the dominant polymer types in uh, most of the samples. And concerning the, the tire wear um, particles, we found medium high concentrations in untreated snow and untreated stormwater and approximately 1,000 times higher concentrations in road-related uh, runoff. And uh, yeah, with this, I would like to, to thank you uh, all for your attention. And uh, I would like to thank the EU Interreg uh, Fantastic Sea Project for financing this, uh, this study and all the involved project partners for their, for their hard work. And from our side, also special thanks to one of our colleagues, Jeanette Lückenmark, who was uh, providing the the results on the tire wear particles and uh, Professor Jess Wallertsen uh, for coordinating the project from our side. Yeah, uh, thank you all. And again, my apologies for the technical difficulties um, at the beginning. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have questions also already to you. Uh, so I will write uh, down, take the first one. Ellie is asking, did you use different analysis methods for the tire wear compared to other microplastics, uh, considering the black color interfering with the micro FTR techniques? Which sizes were analyzed? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I will very briefly go, um, go back to the slide because then I can um, explain it a bit better. Uh, oops, sorry. Go first to the slide that I want to show, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were using different techniques. Um, so we used a combination of uh, spectroscopic methods and uh, chromatography methods. Um, because as mentioned, you cannot analyze the, uh, the, the rubber with the same techniques um, or as the, um, the microplastics. So the microplastics were analyzed in a size range of 10 to 300 micrometer using um, micro FTR imaging. Um, as you can see here in the slide, uh, we have this microscope which is coupled to a spectrometer. And um, for the larger particles, we used an ATR FTR. So these are two spectroscopic techniques that allowed us to analyze the different polymers uh, that I presented. Um, and then uh, for the car tire rubber, we used pyrolysis GCMS. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I can add a couple of words, I mean, uh, uh, this is probably one of the most used analytical uh, workflow if you want to target uh, both the so-called uh, traditional microplastic and also the car tire particles because uh, spectroscopic techniques, uh, they cannot detect uh, car type particles due to the high amount of uh, carbon black included in this sort of material, which makes them, uh, let's say, absorbing all the infrared light you use in spectroscopy. Therefore, you need to change approach. And that's why you use a chromatographic uh, uh, separation coupled to a mass spectrometric uh, detection. The pyrolysis is a, an introduction system that basically uh, pyrolyze your sample in an inert atmosphere of helium. And then all the fragments of the molecule that you obtain in the pyrolysis, they are separated in the chromatographic column and detected in a mass spectrometer. This way, you can quantify uh, the presence of uh, specific polymers uh, thanks to their uh, specific fragmentation products. And you can quantify because you can also produce calibration curves by uh, analyzing known amounts of substances. And this is how we analyze uh, car tire particles, basically. 
Thank you for your answer. So there is one more question um, from Alexander. Based on your research experience, which would be the mitigation measure addressing microplastics you would prioritize? I don't know who wants to take this question. That's a very interesting one, um, but also a very tricky one, because as we have seen, um, this kind of source tracking uh, is not so, so easy because the different... Um, the different polymer types that we we found are used in different uh, different sectors of the industry. Um, but since we found like the highest concentrations of microplastics and also um, also tire wear um, particles in in, in road related runoff, I think to uh, it's very important that we target this road runoff and and storm water associated with this uh, to make sure that uh, these don't enter into our, our water streams. Okay, thank you. We are very, very already uh, not in our scheduled time, but maybe the last question, very, very short, you can answer because some of our listeners is confused and says that why are you not flow rates of the river, storm water and so on included in the Analysis, you only present concentrations, but to estimate total load of microplastic flows, the amount of water per pathway is needed. Low concentration and large amount of water means large total load. Can you clarify a bit of this comment? Um, I think I will, uh, the, the, the flows, that is something that uh, Emma will also like uh, introduce in her presentation because um, She's more uh, um, in charge of the, the, the input into into the Baltic Sea. So we were more we were interested, or we were like uh, showing here more the concentrations that we can find. And of course, I, I agree it's important when we want to um, calculate the, the the mass, the input uh, into the Baltic Sea that flow rates need to be considered. Thank you very much. Actually, you gave the priority floor to the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Alvis, for your presentation and your answers. And our next speaker will be uh, Emma Feldstrom from Sweden Water Research. And Emma will tell us more about the city and how the city in the Baltic Sea looks like from the microplastic perspective. So please, Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you. Do you hear me okay? All right, and now you see my presentation, hopefully. Good. Thank you for the introduction. So yes, I am a PhD candidate at Sweden Water Research. And Sweden Water Research is a municipally owned research company that is owned by three water utilities in the southernmost part of Sweden. And uh, I will present the results today um, from the project about sources and pathways of microplastics, particularly in urban waters, so particularly to water. And I think that the uh, last question was very interesting and I hope I will uh, give some uh, answers now. So, first I would like to say a few words about the challenges with the, there are challenges with microplastic research in general, but also, um, and it has still a lot of uncertainties, but uh, for source estimates, uh, there are large uncertainties, which leads to large intervals. And uh, there are a few challenges, uh, particularly for source estimates. Uh, and first of all, as we have seen in the previous presentations today, uh, plastic is a versatile material. It is used for many purposes, which means that we have many sources to consider. And second, as uh, Claudia mentioned, uh, the same polymers are used for many different purposes. So source tracking is not uh, always that easy. And um, there are also differences in the methods used and uh, uh, the sizes that you use. So if you want to make one source estimates of a lot of different studies, they can uh, have done it in different ways and used different sizes. So five millimeters is usually the upper limit, but the lower limit can differ between studies. So like 100, 50, 20 or 10 micrometers, which will impact the results. And then as we saw in the previous presentation, you could use uh, different methods and you need to use different methods for different sources, as well as 
And all these uh, methods have different uh, drawbacks and uh, uh, advantages, but it will impact the results and also how the results are presented. So are we getting the results in mass or particle number or a mass estimate of based on particle number? And all these things we need to consider when we make source estimates. And another thing that can differ between studies that you need to be aware of is that some studies use the uh, the whole, for example, the whole tire particle uh, and count that as microplastics, uh, while as other only use like the rubber part, which would be like 40 to 60%. The same can go for paint flakes. Like some, in some studies it's counted the whole particle, while as in other it's the polymer content. So, but the, despite the, all these uh, uncertainties, uh, what do we know about sources and pathways of microplastics in the urban water system? And that is what we have uh, been investigating in this project. So one of the outputs of the project is a, a quite simple and easy to use Excel-based tool for estimating sources to urban waters. So uh, by urban waters, I mean wastewater and stormwater particularly. And uh, uh, this tool is uh, accompanied by a, with a report that, uh, uh, based on a literature review, explains each source, how you could calculate the source estimate, uh, the information that is needed by the, the user, uh, so like the contextual information, which could be how many inhabitants do you have to your wastewater treatment plant, for example. Uh, so what is needed and also like for each source, what polymer types would we expect and the shapes that we would expect, as well as some information about the uh, expected pathways of these sources. Um, but as I mentioned before, there are still large uncertainties and uh, we wanted to know more about the, how microplastic flows uh, in a city in the Baltic Sea. Uh, as part of this project. So you saw uh, that uh, by now, I think that you, all of you have understood that we have taken a lot of samples in a lot of different environments in this project. So, and what we have done uh, is that we have combined these um, samples that we have taken, the measurements in different uh, environments with the uh, source estimates to uh, investigate the flow in a semi-hypothetical case city, as I call it. And this means that this uh, um, city does not exist, but the characteristics of this city is built up on the characteristics of the different cities that we have been sampling in the project. So, but um, to say in general term, this city has about 100,000 inhabitants. It uh, has uh, approximately 40% hard surfaces. The majority are buildings. But we also have roads and parking lots considered. And um, it has a large drinking water treatment plant or drinking water plant uh, and one wastewater treatment plant with an activated sludge project uh, process. Um, it has some combined sewer system, uh, about 8%, and that means that some of the stormwater is added to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, this also means that we have some combined sewer overflows, that is the CSOs, uh, and that means that uh, untreated or partially treated uh, water will can enter the re recipient, and the uh, recipient is a river. Uh, the climate is, uh, the average temperature is about nine degrees and ha it has uh, uh, quite a lot of precipitation, main, which mainly falls as rain and a little bit as snow. So this uh, is the picture that Matlena showed earlier. So it's uh, the estimation of uh, flows of microplastic to wastewater and uh, stormwater. And uh, I will zoom into uh, wastewater first. So uh, first, the largest one uh, in this, from the source estimates uh, was uh, laundry. Uh, and this is, uh, has been suggested by several different studies that uh, this is a large source 
of uh, microplastics to wastewater. The uh, range is very large and that is due to uh, the, that the emission factor is quite large uh, because different studies show very different results. Um, and uh, we took uh, uh, samples at the outlet of a drinking water plant and this was uh, quite low. So the, um, uh, the red circles are source estimates and the green circles are uh, um, based on uh, extrapolated uh, from measurements. This was quite low and we took the outlet of a drink, uh, drinking water plant and then uh, assumed that the collection system and the uptake in humans is uh, small. Dust was a source estimate that had a quite small contribution. Uh, this is uh, all of these are in kilos per year, but uh, that can also be because uh, we have uh, some going to uh, solid the waste instead, and that is uh, because uh, most people will vacuum before they uh, wet wash. And from a water utility perspective, we really want people to vacuum before they wet wash to have as little load to the wastewater uh, treatment plant as uh, possible. So we also took samples from the outlet and then uh, from a yearly load, it was quite low. So it only made up about seven kilos per year from, the, from this uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant. And even if the uh, load to inlet is quite large, as we see that it's not uncommon to have 90, over 99% reduction in a conventional wastewater treatment plant. We, um, I wanted to say a few words about the uh, uh, mitigation or uh, abatement strategies as well. And there are several, uh, several countries that are prohibiting uh, microplastics in uh, um, personal care products that are rinsed off. And that would be make up about, uh, when they, these are prohibited, they would make up about 20% of the, uh, maximum 20% of the um, microplastics at inlet. And also, as we heard in the first session today, there is a, a suggestion for uh, banning all intentionally added. And that means also the personal care products that are uh, left on the skin, like in makeup and things like that, and in cleaning products. And then uh, the, there will be a reduction with about 40%. Um, there is also a discussion about uh, filters in washing machines, uh, and that can reduce the load from laundry with uh, uh, about 65% from this source. Uh, every now and then we talk about the adding some advanced treatment steps to wastewater treatment plant and that can give has shown in other studies to give a good reduction um, uh, for example a disk filter or and a biofilter has been uh, previously researched and it gives a good uh, reduction but uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, additionally but in terms of total load for a a year it, uh, it's still quite small and that is because the, uh, at least in this hypothetical case city we had a very low um, a, a low number in, or a low mass in effluent. So then we look at stormwater which is a little bit more challenging in terms of pathways but um, so uh, the largest uh, source estimate was from cigarette filters and also from uh, paint. But if you remember from Claudia Slaud, we didn't find so much cellulose acetate uh, as we would as I would expect, uh, and not so much paint either as uh, these source estimates suggest. And then based on the sampling, we had quite low um, from road, uh, from roof runoff and uh, parking lots and uh, the road related remissions. But then if we add, these are only microplastics. And then if we add the tire wear particles, we are, uh, this changes the picture drastically. And that, because now we're talking about tons per year 
uh, and it's a quite big range in the sample as well, but about like a, a, a thousand tons per year from the roads, uh, from all roads, and then a hundred from parking lots. And this is, I tried um, to see if I could, uh, I made a theoretical contribution from the specific road that we sampled to the sampling point, and then compared that to what we found in the measured values and uh, actually it was uh, I estimated more microplastics than we actually found and I estimated less car tire particles uh, than we found which is uh, interesting and I have to think about and uh, investigate this uh, further mm, because in my previous research when I've looked at wastewater I have always found uh, less uh, that that the measured values have always been in the lower or in the middle of the interval um, from the source estimates. Yes, that was all from me. I would like to thank uh, all the partners in the projects for the hard work and uh, the financers, uh, both uh, for Fan Plastic C and for the co-financing that we got from the uh, Swedish EPA. Um, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, so much. And thank you for being so quick, actually, and bring us back more on, oh. on, on time that we are a bit losing. But anyway, uh, so now I see the questions from the participants and I still don't see anything new that comes up. But um, yeah, you just finished the presentation and usually it takes a bit of time. So let's wait if some someone will uh, write something to you, but otherwise, if not, then probably we can forward the questions to you also later and you can answer yes. them directly to the person who will be interested. Uh, so thank you very much once again, Emma. And uh, now let's move to our next speaker. And as already we have heard today many times that uh, in this uh, fun plastic project in these three years, there have been opportunities to check concrete technologies that can remove uh, microplastics from snow and also wastewater. And now we can see in detail these pilot cases. And uh, there I would like to actually invite the next three speakers what we will have. So first will be Marjata Vakvarselka from Natural Resource Institute Finland. Marjata is research scientist at Natural Resource Institute Finland and her work is currently focused on microplastics removal technologies and she will give us the first presentation. So, Marietta, I hope I, you can hear me, <laughs> and the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra, for your introduction, and hello, everyone. Um, I'll tell you about our two pilots uh, focusing on my microplastics removal um, from urban snow. And first, some data on snow management in Finland. During winter time, uh, large amounts of snow are collected from roads in Finnish cities into snow collecting or dumping sites. The amounts can be up to 300,000 uh, truckloads in Helsinki area annually. When the snow melts, the impurities are litter in the snow end up in stormwaters and finally in the sea. In very uh, snowy winters, about 60,000 truckloads of this urban snow are dumped untreated into the sea in Helsinki. According to recent reports, microplastic concentrations up to 10,000 um, particles per cubic meter of snow have been detected in urban snow. Um, we also know that traffic related microplastics are abundant in road runoffs. Here are the two um, pilots studied by Lucas uh, project group in this uh, Fan Plastic C project. The first pilot is a filter made of harvested common uh, reed. It was tested for microplastics removal from meltwaters of uh, urban snow in Kovola in co cooperation with uh, the city of Kovola and a local co cooperative um, called Sustainably from Nature. This cooperative uh, develops new and innovative uh, ways to utilize common reed which otherwise can cause eutrophication of waters when growing in abundance. Uh, the second pilot it was tested in collaboration with the Finnish clean tech company Klevat. 
the company has developed novel technology for snow melting and purification. First about the reed field pilot. Uh, three uh, common reed uh, filters have previously been built in Kovola area by the city of Kovola and, and, and this cooperative. These filters have been tested in the ditches for removal of solid particles and nutrients from storm waters. And the results have been um, very promising. There is a large snow dumping site in Kovola and in spring, the, its snow meltwaters run to a pond and further along a ditch and to a river, leading finally to the Baltic Sea. Therefore, a common reed filter was built uh, in the outlet ditch of the snow collecting site to pilot the ability of the filter to remove uh, microplastics and other uh, particles released from snow piles. Um, this common reed was harvested at a local lake during previous winter. About uh, 350 reed bundles were used um, for the pilot uh, filter and three logs were placed on top of the bundles to keep the bundles in place. It took about one hour to build the filter construction and the expenses were about 200 uh, euros. Last winter was very snowy and cold here. Uh, so snow samples were collected from the snow dumping site in March. Samples from the ditch water before and after the reed filter were taken in late May when the snow was finally melting. Also additional water samples were analyzed, for example, for suspended solids, solids water temperature and flow rate once a month. As you can see from the figure uh, showing ditch water temperature and amounts of suspended solids, the filter started to retain suspended solids when the water temperature had increased above 12 degrees of Celsius. At the end of, the, of our observation time period, 35% uh, of total suspended solids in the ditch water was retained by the filter. Then an um, active biofilm had most probably um, developed onto the reed material. The dashed line in the figure indicates the sampling time of microplastic samples. According to the analysis performed at Arborg University, cartier related microplastics were detected in snow samples, but not in the ditch water suggesting that tire rubber particles in snow meltwater flowing into the pond were retained in the pond sediment. And the efficiency of the reed filter in micro microplastic um, removal needs to be further studied and more samples taken at various time points. Then I move to the other pilots. In the clever process, snow is melted by using the power of flowing water and uh, the temperature of uh, seawater or waste heat from the district heating network. And this leads to a more sustainable process than in the other methods used for snow melting when fossil fuel is used. Um, the macro and um, micro liter in in, in the snow meltwater is uh, collected in the process with the combination of a steel filter system and a filter cloth. Um, Clevat asked us to optimize the mesh, mesh size for the filter cloth. Uh, actually, uh, the mesh size is a compromise between microplastic removal efficiency and the capacity of the uh, in the snow treatment. Mesh sizes of 50 and 150 micrometers were tested. As seen in the figure, urban snow seems to contain microplastic particles, especially in the smallest uh, size ranges studied. According to our filtering experiments, the mesh size of 50 micrometers was suitable, as major part of snow originated microplastics particles were removed then.
um, as a summary of these two technical solutions presented here, it can be said that um, the read filter is easy to and cheap to build and maintain, and it is locally adaptable. We concluded that a period of conditioning for biofilm formation is needed for optimal operation of the filter. We also think that the reed filter is suitable especially for treatment of uh, storm waters with ambient temperatures, maybe not so much for cold snow melt waters. Um, local conditions also influence the, the removal efficiency and operating time of the reed filter. The reed filters in Kovola uh, area have operated well for about um, two years before any need for changing the reed material. Uh, the clever snow melting process also has several advantages. It is based on sustainable snow melting technology. The unit can be operated both on land and uh, floating on water. And as a decentralized system, it reduces snow transport distances. And the mesh size of 50 micrometers seems to be efficient in microplastics removal. The investment and operating, operating costs of the two technologies tested are here presented in categories high, medium and low, according to our um, estimations and calculations. Also, the microplastic removal efficiency of these solutions as evaluated is shown here. The further development work is clearly still needed to fully understand these systems and to optimize their operation. It has been um, hard work outdoors with our pilots, especially uh, in winter conditions, but it has also been um, very interesting and uh, great fun. Thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have a first question to you from Edvi. Would you say that the pilots testing are appropriate for scaling up and use in the city of Helsinki, for example? Uh, yes, Helsinki. Uh, the city of Helsinki has been very interested in in the in in um, 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 melting and um, purification. Um, unit and uh, they tested a demo um, system um, this um, last winter and um, we'll see what happens next. Okay, thank you. So we are still waiting. Maybe some other question appears to you as well here. Uh, actually, we just got the question to Emma as well. I don't know, Emma, if you are here, maybe you want to answer right now or or better, let's move it uh, like forward your question directly and you can answer it directly. Um, I can answer. Oh, well, you are here, so maybe we can really uh, skip to this question. Anne Charlotte uh, was asking uh, to you, would you say that filters, uh, domestic washing machines are having a good idea, catches up approximately 65% of the microplastics, or is the wastewater treatments better equipped to catch the microplastics, take, uh, taking the production of filters, transportation, and so on in consideration? This is the question to you. Uh, yes. Uh, well, what we have seen is that uh, there was, uh, this is uh, very much at the beginning of the research, so it's, I think, one or two studies that have looked into the effect of the filters in the, in the washing machines. And there are a few aspects to uh, consider uh, that may lead me to not give a clear answer yet, but because uh, what we have seen is that fibers are quite difficult to capture in the uh, wastewater treatment plant compared to, uh, for example, these uh, microbeads that are in uh, personal care products because of the shape that it can uh, um, escape even filters. So that would suggest that it's better to use it upstream. But uh, when you have uh, it in each... Um, of the domestic washing machines, there is also a, it has to be very user-friendly and um, easy to uh, clean. Uh, 
uh, and it, it can it, that the user uses it correctly and not, for example, rinse it in the sink, uh, but but uh, throw it in the solid waste instead. So uh, I think that we need um, maybe a life cycle assessment uh, before this decision can be made. Okay, thank you so much, Emma, for your reply. So we switched a bit <laughs> speakers, but uh, this is the real situation when we have sometimes delay on the questions that reach us. So thank you, Emma, once again. And uh, so let's check if we have one more question to our previous speakers. So yes, I think it's for you. So Mariana, Marina is asking, what is the role of the biofilm? Will microorganisms, including protests ingest the particles and those keep them from the outflow but as their lifetime is very short they would probably release the particles soon when they die is regular harvesting of the reed necessarily i think this question goes to our uh, previous speaker so mariata is to you okay thank you about the biofilm um i don't think the microbes um have time to digest the micro um, particles uh, but they form this um, gel like um, network that captures uh, the the particles and then about this uh, reed harvesting um, the harvesting of common reed is um, is um, uh, performed very much actually at least in finland because of the 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 role of, of the the reed in eutrophication of the waters so if you find some new ways to utilize the otherwise waste material then i, I think it is good thank you for your answer so let's move uh, further to our next presentation and we will talk more about the technologies that can help to reduce microplastic from wastewater. And that's why I would like to invite Ms. Katar Zinyakur from Gdańsk Water Utilities. Uh, Katar Zinya is technological specialist at Gdańsk Water Utilities. And in the Fan Plastic Sea project, she was responsible for conducting the pilot study on microplastics removal from the final effluent of the constructed wetland pilot station at Gdańsk wastewater treatment plant. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, yes, so the first pilot project that uh, I would like to present uh, is uh, connected to the stormwater treatment. And now I would like to thank Małgorzata, which helped a lot during the, the process of uh, presentation. Um, the pilot station for stormwater treatment uh, was located nearby um, Seaside District and nearby the stormwater collector, uh, which uh, catches um, the stormwater uh, from the area of around 70 square uh, kilometers uh, from a highly urbanized catchment area. Um, the technological scheme of the station uh, involves uh, uh, multiple multi-stage uh, constructed wetland. So uh, at the first stage, we have a sedimentation tank uh, for gathering the waste, the storm water, uh, to pump it to the two uh, different types of uh, constructed wetland beds, which is uh, at the first stage, vertical flow, subsurface constructed wetland, and then the wastewater can flow to the horizontal flow constructed wetland. A very interesting element of the pilot station is also this uh, next uh, reservoir with variable bed depth. And with these conditions, we can obtain different, uh, uh, different oxygen conditions, different um, redox potential for uh, the differentiation in uh, nutrients removal, especially. Uh, at the last um, element of the, of the pilot station was a storage tank for the purified water uh, for the sampling purposes. And the water quality uh, parameters were tested with, uh, with a few uh, probes, which were installed uh, before and after the treatment process. Uh, it were, these were probes uh, regarding temperature, redox, conductivity, but also oxygen, turbidity, and pH. And the analysis 
that were conducted during the pilot project involved, uh, of course, microplastics, uh, nutrients, uh, organic matter, heavy metals, um, phthalates, some uh, new emerging contaminants like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, and also microbial contamination. Um, regarding the research results, uh, the stormwater samples were collected um, in uh, 2021, in October and November. And stormwater um, directed to the station was characterized by a variable load of specific contaminants. And the system enabled uh, partial or even uh, complete uh, removal of specific substances and uh, emerging pollutants. And it is worth to mention that uh, the constructed wetlands system was effective in uh, removing heavy metals, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and microbial pollution as well from the stormwater. Uh, for the microplastics results, uh, we can see that the, the largest uh, share of the mass of microplastics uh, is attributed to polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester and alkyd, for which uh, the results in removal uh, reached around 90% uh, except for polyester. Uh, high efficiency in the removal of uh, some pollutants like heavy metals, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and uh, microplastics in this multi-stage constructed wetland pilot station uh, requires, uh, I think, uh, further investigation to uh, get knowledge uh, what exact processes are occurring within the wetland beds uh, to better understand uh, what the bio um, generation, what the bioaccumulation is, and what are other processes uh, occurring in the wetland, like sorption, for example. Uh, now let's focus uh, on the second pilot station. Uh, that was conducted for the uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, the analysis were conducted uh, in the constructed wetland pilot station located at the premises of the Gdańsk wastewater treatment plant. Um, on the right left, on the right hand side, you can see some general numbers uh, regarding the the pilot the the, the station the, the pilot plant. Um, our Gdańsk wastewater treatment plant is based on mechanical biological treatment of uh, wastewater uh, with enhanced nutrients removal. Uh, the effluent receiver is of course the Baltic Sea. Uh, the wastewater treated wastewater is directed uh, to the Baltic Sea, not the Vistola River. And uh, what is the size of our wastewater treatment plant? Uh, regarding the flow, it reaches uh, almost 100,000 cubic meters per day. And this pilot station uh, was built as a hybrid two-stage constructed wetland system uh, to test the treated wastewater before it is discharged uh, to the Gulf of Gdańsk. Um, in the technological scheme, you can see some specifics uh, regarding the design of each of the wetland beds. As you can see, the first stage was a, a horizontal flow constructed wetland uh, with the main layer was sand. And the second stage um, was vertical flow constructed wetland. And the size of each bed was around uh, one square meter. And the flow rates that were applied to the, to the station was about uh, 50 to 20 liters per hour. The treated wastewater, uh, the concentrations uh, of it, you can see in the table below on the right. Um, for example, organic matter, uh, solids, uh, total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So uh, you can see that uh, very low loading rates were applied to the, to the constructed wetland. Um, the microplastics uh, analysis um, from the pilot station uh, are coming soon. So we would like to have them in a few months. And uh, regarding the results from the wastewater treatment plant, we can say that uh, around 73 uh, kilograms per day are uh, in flowing to the, to the wastewater treatment plant from the whole city. And uh, after the treatment processes, uh, we have around 0.1 kilograms per day uh, in the effluent, um, which is directed to the Baltic Sea. And uh, 
it was around 40 kilograms per year. Uh, so what uh, is the transportation fate of microplastics in the wastewater treatment plant? Uh, the main uh, share of the, of the microplastics uh, are coming to the sewage sludge and um, processed and after digestion, after anaerobic digestion, the sewage sludge, in our case, in the case of city of Gdańsk, uh, the sludge is directed to the incineration plant. We also conducted some additional studies regarding, for example, nutrients which were removed at um, the rate of uh, around 50% for nitrogen and 40% for phosphorus. And uh, there are also ongoing studies on microbiological composition in the wetland beds. Uh, the samples were taken throughout the, the study period from July to uh, October and the samples were taken from different depths and different distances from the inlet and outlet of the wetlands. And uh, this way, uh, we are uh, focused on obtaining, no obtaining knowledge uh, on what uh, processes, what biological processes are occurring in the bed uh, to better understand uh, the conditions uh, with treated wastewater uh, input to the, to the wetland. Um, and this, with this uh, thought, I would like to uh, thank you very much uh, for the for the for all the help in the in the project, and the possibility to conduct the studies, and also thank thank you Małgorzata for preparing the slides also with me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, there is also now time for short questions if we have. Uh, so otherwise, I think we will wait for them. And while the next speaker will have the presentation, we will address you them a bit later. Yes, for a while, I think we don't have um, nothing for you to ask us. Ah, we have only compliments for you for thank you for <laughs> great presentation of Gdańsk water pilot installation. So otherwise, let's uh, move to the next presentation and next presentation. We will have from Teresa Jepson from Swedish uh, Sweden Water Research, and uh, she, Teresa will tell us more about specific filtration techniques. Uh, Teresa has PhD in marine biology from Lund University, and after her dissertation, her work has focused on research and development issues within the area of environmental, environment, climate, and community planning in municipalities. So, Teresa, please. Hi, thank you. It's, uh, I hope you hear me correctly. Uh, yes, as you said, my name is Therese Jepsen and I'm working for Sweden Water Research as a product manager. And uh, I'm really happy to, to be included here in the Fan Plastic C final conference. Uh, I want to talk to you about the membrane ultrafiltration technique that we are uh, now have included in the Fan Plastic project together with the Horizon Finance project called Rewise, which is the project that I am a project manager for. And I also want to tell you all that uh, the experts here are really Professor Frank Lipniski and our PhD student Mina Takil. So if you have more specific questions on the techniques uh, concerning ultrafiltration, I will uh, ask you to, to ask them later on. And so uh, to move forward, um, so why are we working on the, the ultrafiltration technique? Well, the aim here is actually to be able to uh, purify rain and storm water, to be able to reuse it in properties for toilet flushing, washing machines and irrigation. But the aim is also, of course, to decrease the discharge of hazardous substances, including microplastics. So we believe that this is a win-win situation and that if we may purify and clean the stormwater in the cities, uh, we can also decrease the usage, usage of high water quality drinking water. Uh, so this is a collaboration now and we have started with uh, this pilot of ultrafiltration technique. Uh, I will continue with explain a little bit about what is what type of ultrafiltration are we working with. And uh, since the pilot is, uh, is included as a collaboration and we have just did it in a very late stage, I think, of the fantastic project, 
but I cannot um, tell you any results yet, but I will then ex instead ex explain the potential and what we are going to, to test. So uh, what we are using here is a type of uh, ceramic membranes, which are very like a very robust filter. And the membrane uh, filtration technique uh, compared to other more conventional stormwater treatment techniques like the wet pond sand filters and biofilters um, are very compact and they are modular and could yeah they could remove also bacteria micropollutants and also microplastics down to the nanometer if we nanometer levels if we want to uh, so this could be something that could be used in specific areas where we have very limited space for example um, uh, yeah like yeah, for example within a property or in a very uh, uh, tight area urban area in the city so the Positive thing while to use my membranes is that it can also, we can then be able to reduce the membrane area within these types of um, ultrafiltration pilots if it turns out that we have, for example, an overcapacity. So the membrane technique uh, that we are, are testing now within the uh, Fantastic project has not been tested for microplastics before. Um, so it's very interesting to see if how this works, even if we are, uh, we know that the technique is not very old itself. It, it's rather, it's, it is pos possible that we will actually have a complete um, uh, decrease in microplastics after we have used the membrane techniques. So um, what we have done so far is that we have um, installed a pilot uh, it, by a rain and stormwater pond in Lone, close to the Sweden Water Research Office. And here the prototype unit uh, consists, you can see it on the picture actually, it's rather la large here, but it consists of submerged membranes uh, with an area of up to 10 cubic meter. And it has a capacity to clean the storm uh, water with up to 1000 liters per hour. Uh, so this is a quite large um, unit and um, initially we have chosen this ceramic uh, membranes but it could be also it could include other filtrations or um, techniques if we want to but for now we have a capacity to in a pore size of 0 0.2 micrometers and a molecular weight cutoff of approximately 400 kilo dalton and the uh, we believe at least that this will remove um, a lot of the microplastics and, and also micropollutants that we see uh, in the pond. So, as and also, uh, I maybe didn't mention it, but it's uh, the, the pilot is now placed by a stormwater pond uh, in a very urban area in, in, uh, in Lund municipality. So, what we are, if we look a little bit more to the membrane processes that we see this is inside the pilot at the moment and here we actually pump water from the pond up to a first of a 700 liter membrane tank and after that it is pushed through with pressure over the membranes through the membranes in a little bit more smaller tank a process tank and here we can actually get all the microplastics and other uh, pollutants collected in a more permanent tank. And after that, we will have the purified water transported out again and out into the pond. So this is how it works at the moment. And the microplastic, the maximum microplastic concentration will then be collected within the pilot. So at the moment, we have taken samples uh, by the pond. Um, close to the outlet from the pond uh, first and we are will take samples after we we have um, transported the water through the ultrafiltration and membrane tanks and uh, at the moment these samples are prepared by Lund University and uh, uh, with a lot of uh, help from uh, Claudia and Olbor University. Uh, hopefully we will be able to send these samples for, for analysis rather soon. 
since it's also very interesting to see how a pond itself may uh, horrify um, microplastics, we have, will also actually take some samples uh, at the different places within the pond. So we will take some samples also close to the to the inlet to the pond, or uh, yep, and and compare these with the ones from the outlet to the pond. Uh, at the moment, uh, this is what we are doing. Unfortunately, we don't have the results yet, but hopefully we'll get them uh, rather soon so that we can explain more about how this technique could work. And um, for that, this will be my last slide. And uh, the next step then is actually also for us to optimize this ultrafiltration technique and to do uh, like a technical economical evaluation of uh, of how to continue working with this technique to be able to to reuse rain and storm water and to uh, purify it from the pollutants that is needed so um, this i don't have much more and uh, i think i have uh, then i will just finish with my last um, last thank you slide and that is to uh, to you of course and also i want to thank you thank you uh, the Lund University uh, laboratories uh, that are actually helping us a lot at the moment. And if you have more questions concerning the membrane technique, please uh, also contact Frank Lipniski, who is the person who is actually developing the, mem the membrane unit at the moment. Okay, so that was all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, very much. Uh, we are also waiting your results that you are still. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But we have a question from Sama. How do you deal with the accumulated or concentrated microparticles? Yes, I expected that question. <laughs> uh, but at the moment, we will, we will have to actually send it to, uh, to a, a more a wastewater, uh, waste treatment plant, plant that will actually then uh, also, um, it will not be diluted into the environment again. It will be considered like a, a pollution uh, and and taken care of by a, a, a big, um, yeah, I don't know what it's called in, in English now, but it's called CSAV in Swedish. Maybe Jesper can help me. <laughs> uh, so that will not, we will take care of that separately at the moment. And it will be also concentrated rather much. So they will transport it away from the pilot at the moment, yes. And there is one more question to you uh, from Itra. How do you foresee to tackle traditional problems associated to membranes in connection with clogging when big volumes or water is treated? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Since we have just started this at the moment, uh, and the technique has been mainly used for wastewater and wastewater treatment plants before. And here, of course, there are a lot of problems with clogging and you have to have um, maybe more chemical cleaning. Uh, what we have seen so far, this is not the case for some world water and, and at all, because it's not that much, it's, it is not that um, polluted initially. So we have to have some type of pretreatment, of course, but then uh, we, we can't answer completely that question yet. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think for the rest of the questions, if they will reach us, so we will let you know and we will forward them to you. But otherwise, I think we reach the point when we are ready to go have the lunch break and lunch break, we will have almost an hour long. Uh, but I remind you that after the lunch break, we come back here at two o'clock and we will have a panel discussion and we will discuss there such a good topic like microplastics, its present and future in the Baltic Sea. So there are a lot of things to talk about from policy perspective communication uh, and also industry and research perspectives. So all these aspects are waiting us also very, very soon. And then at the second part of uh, this second session, we will have, as I mentioned before, uh, communication activities presentations. So also uh, don't miss it and be with us at two o'clock when we follow the Eastern European time zone. So see you. Welcome back and welcome to this panel discussion where we will focus on microplastics present and future in the Baltic Sea. 
Uh, we will talk about this topic from four different perspectives, from research, policy, and also uh, industry and um, communication and, let's say, awareness raising aspects. So that's why we, in these next 45 minutes, we'll have here four panelists, four experts. Uh, some of them you already have seen today, but I kindly ask you as well, be active and uh, send us uh, your questions to the panelists the same way how you did it in the previous session. So just write in the comment and question uh, section uh, right below the video you are watching right now. So uh, let me introduce you with our uh, panelists. So we already will have here um, Mikhail Papadoyanakis. He presents here policy and EU perspective, and we already introduced you with uh, Mikhail in um, the first session. So um, Mikhail, nice to see you here. Uh, our scientific community today will be represented by Mr. Yes Abolerstan from Aalborg University. Uh, do you hear us? Yes, yes. So, uh, yes, Wollerstein is Professor of Environmental Engineering at Aalborg University in Denmark, and his background is biological and chemical processes and pollu pollutants in urban technical waters. So it will be interesting to uh, hear also your perspective. Communication and information part in this panel discussion is represented by uh, Ms. Valeria uh, Zagirova from Environmental Center Ekat Kaliningrad. Valeria is a deputy head of international projects and environmental management department of environmental center and has a master degree in ecology and nature management. And the final industry representative we have here today from Gdańsk Water Utilities, Ms. Monika Piotrowska Stiprit. Sorry if I don't pronounce correct your surname. Uh, but uh, Monica has PhD in marine chemistry and she is interested in ecology and environmental protection. So welcome everyone. Hello. I hope you hear us, hear me. Uh, the first question, what I would uh, ask you, it will be similar to all of you. So from each your perspective, you can maybe give us insight. How do you see the current situation of microplastic pollution in the Baltic Sea? Which would be the main issues you would tackle from your perspective, either it's policy or industry or research? So maybe I will start with, uh, yes. Yeah. Start with I mean, um, <clears throat> I think one thing to think about when we're talking about microplastics is that it is not evenly distributed. So you have uh, some areas where you have uh, very little and some where you have a lot. And of course, where you have a lot is also where you get the impacts. And uh, I would like to have a better understanding on uh, where you have a lot, especially of the very small particles where you have a big impact. I think this is one of the main things in my eyes. Okay, we probably will uh, talk about it in detail, why somewhere is a lot and somewhere not so much. So how much we know about these pathways and the problems and accumulation, but uh, how about policy perspective? Michael? Thank you. Um, well, from a policy perspective, I think we, um, we do have some, some uh, instruments at our disposal but we certainly do not have all the instruments that we need at our disposal. This is why we're in the process of developing or, or uh, evaluating options for, for the, the best possible solutions and also developing policy instruments, uh, including at the, of a regulatory nature if needed. But further to that, I would say that we need um, to monitor also the impact of, the, of our policies on the marine environment and to adjust these policies on the basis of what we learn from the states of the marine environment. So this is another, I mean, uh, uh, we also have for this purpose uh, instruments, but we need to constantly use them and improve them. Uh, as to the level, um, I would say that um, we need to, to tackle the, uh, the problems at the appropriate level. Uh, that is to say, um, if you take, for example, products in the composition of products, um, is something that uh, is very relevant for microplastics, as we have seen. But the composition of products not necessarily or not best regulated or tackled at the national or regional level. Maybe we need, uh, uh, for this purpose, something like the EU level. For other uh, issues, if you take, for example, uh, um, pellets losses from, from shipping, maybe for this we need a global instrument. 
So or standards for design of products uh, to, uh, to facilitate recycling and so on and so forth. So the higher the scale, uh, the higher the level, the better, because it will be applied in a more consistent way. So this is, uh, I hope that this replies at least partly to, to your expectations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we can talk about it in detail in the coming minutes. But uh, Monica, what will be the industry point of view about the current issues? How industry sees that? Yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so once again, sorry for the delay. I was not watchful for the clock, so five minutes, <laughs> uh, the delay. But uh, coming to the point, uh, we have to remember that uh, plastic and microplastic, these are uh, things that we cannot avoid uh, completely uh, because there are many products that cannot be replaced by, uh, by other alterna alternatives. And uh, of course, uh, basing uh, also on, on, um, on the analysis that we did under the project, we realized that uh, wastewater uh, treatment plants uh, are really, have a really good efficiency in uh, removing microplastics, but it is not uh, vanishing. It, it stays in the, in the uh, sewage sludge. Uh, that uh, very often is used for fertilizing uh, or uh, remediation of damaged areas. Uh, so this is a kind of new uh, source of microplastic afterwards. And if we would like to um, increase the efficiency of wastewater treatment plants, for example, by using ma ma uh, um, membranes, um, uh, this technology is uh, quite expensive at the moment, so, so not every plant can, uh, um, uh, can apply such technology because of, of these expenses. Uh, so yeah, basically this is what I wanted to say. So you would highlight the financial aspect and technological aspect of this as well. Thank you. So, Valeria, I have a question also to you about the maybe in general public awareness and uh, how we see this problem lately. What you would call the biggest issue or how to tackle the problem from which angle to start? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we need to understand that uh, microplastic pollution problem, it is a not a uh, problem which will be solved for one day or even a year. So uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, it uh, should be uh, solved by step by step. Uh, and uh, according to the awareness raising or informational campaigns, it's uh, important to show the people uh, why it is really a problem and how it will be affect further. So they will understand completely why they should separate with their waste, for, for instance, or why they should do uh, uh, to take to spend more actions to buy products without uh, any packaging or something else. So, uh, and if, of course, it's a question also of monitoring its methods and comparable data and relevant data, first of all, of course. So, this is the main challenge more information as general. <laughs> Yeah, but as already as yes at the beginning uh, mentioned, that's like the problem is that it's not everywhere the same situation. So somewhere there's a lot of microplastic, somewhere maybe less. But still, maybe you could uh, con con concretize a bit your 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 idea that what are the trends? Can we say that in general we see that situation is getting worse, or we can say that's more or less the same level when we talk about this previous, let's say, five or a few years. Or uh, if to thought, uh, th think about the impact on humans, on ecosystem in general, what are the trends in this field? Uh, from my experience, I see only positive changes, like uh, may more people started to interest in uh, more natural products, for instance. In case of cosmetics, we, we see even in the, our shops uh, more natural ingredients. I saw some products with no microplastic free, and uh, from my even friends, they stopped using some 
packaging and uh, shoppers. So I see only positive social changes because uh, people become more aware and our campaigns uh, achieve the target groups I see. Or maybe they're just like living in some bubble where it seems that some part of society is getting more aware and in general public actually is not so shifted towards these changes. You. Uh, you know, even in case of uh, single-use plastic, in Russia we don't see any special uh, rules according to this. But uh, many of uh, our people started to use uh, many, uh, not single-use uh, single plastic, but uh, uh, reusable plastic uh, things for picnics and uh, some... It's, it's also maybe a little, uh, little example, but uh, really uh, effective and... Uh, Yes, we can see it. What do science say about that? Do we have some monitoring that says that the situation is becoming worse? Maybe I can ask yes uh, to you to follow. Yeah, that brings us into the issue about being able to monitor with any precision. Uh, and and uh, measuring microplastics is uh, a developing field, which is uh, we're much better at it now than we were. Uh, but it's not like if you measure like <clears throat> some pharmaceutical hyperprofene or something like that, you know exactly what it is, you know exactly how to analyze for it and how to and to quality ensure what you're doing. So um, so the whole issue about telling has it become worse, has it become better in the environment is 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 really not answerable because that would require that you have accurate analytical methods but also back in time and also into the future which brings us into uh, into the discussion about how to monitor and uh, i think there are several reasons uh, to monitor there is one basically to ensure uh, compliance, uh, have comparable results all over Europe and so on, which don't necessarily have to be the accurate amount of plastics in the environment, as long as it is reproducible and scalable to some degree, and also affordable, because it is uh, pretty uh, pretty uh, expensive to to do a uh, to do the highest accuracy uh, monitoring. Um, has it become better? Has it become worse? I mean, I would say my, my gut feeling, but that's not anything based on science, is it has become better because there is an increased awareness, meaning people behave better because they are aware. Uh, so so, so uh, I think it's definitely going in the right direction. And there's many reasons why we should um, tackle the plastic issue uh, one is the pollution, and another is it's a whole resource resource discussion, right? So there are many good reasons for, for doing this. Yeah. But also today in these presentations, we heard so many sources from where the microplastic actually comes from. And if to consider just like single-use plastics that we talk for years already, maybe there I can imagine that people would say, okay, we raise awareness and maybe we reduce these products. We have the legislation that even asks us to, to change them completely. And there we can expect these positive changes you mentioned. But how about all the other sources we heard today, the car tires, all the city dust issues? It seems that it's never ending list of the sources so is it really possible that it will become better yeah i think so i mean because because when you are aware of a problem you start to, to act the, the 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 way to act is of course not to say that all the cars have to have iron tires right because that's sort of not a solution that would just create many other problems but uh, when you are when you are working with tires, for example, you would uh, try to design your tires so that you have the biggest possible wear particles because they are the easiest to remove in the treatment unit. So, so, so this is the way, for example, the car tire industry is starting to think, and and um, and then I think that that's that's the way forward. Again, we 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 will not and shall not have a plastic-free world, because uh, plastics has done a lot of good. It is it is the the, the mismanaging of the plastic resource which is a problem, and not uh, the product itself.
Uh, maybe uh, Michael can uh, uh, um, answer as well now how much uh, policy is now ready to shift towards these uh, areas that we mentioned, like car tires or somewhere where we can't see so easily. You can't ask person, don't drive your car tomorrow, but can we ask the industry to change and how much we will expect then policy should push it and legislation should push it? Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, and this is precisely why we are preparing uh, legislation, if needed, uh, for, for this kind of uh, emissions. And by the way, I don't know whether you had the time to share the chat. Today, the Commission published the, uh, the call for interest for this kind of microplastic, tires, pellets, um, <clears throat> uh, textiles, but also all other paints, uh, all other possible important sources of Un so-called unintentional microplastics and the, uh, microplastics that are not used uh, uh, to give a functionality to the product. So, uh, but this is uh, the start of the process and eh? we're going to have a very uh, detailed study, stakeholder consultation and so on. And the various options uh, will be analyzed from the economic, uh, uh, social and environmental point of view. Uh, of course we cannot, and it's, it's it never, crossed anybody's mind to, to ban tires. Huh? But uh, as uh, Jens explained, I mean, there is lot, there's a lot to be done at the design of the tire uh, at this level. Huh? And this uh, cannot be enforced by uh, consumers who just buy the tires. Huh? Uh, it can and should be enforced one way or another uh, at a higher level. So but in how far future or near future you see already that changes will be visible or or monitored like for example you have this policy right now uh, do you foresee that changes will be really in five years and ten years in less than five years period look as um, previous speakers in particular yes explained there are several when you say effect or result we have to know what we're talking about do we talk about the reduction of microplastics at source, this can come quite quickly. Huh? Um, but if we are talking about the reduction of concentrations of microplastics in seawater, huh, this will take some more time because, I mean, these are natural systems, they have their own inertia and so on and so forth. But in terms of reducing the input, there I think we can have quickly some pro, uh, progress with the legislation, but also with the announcement and the preparation of measures. We heard from Russia that, that they don't have a single-use plastics law, but still people are increasingly aware of the problem and they consume less single-use plastics. Huh? Uh, and by the way, it's not because I work in the commission, but I, I need to say that sometimes it can seem long, huh? Um, but then the effect, I mean, to, to prepare and, and adopt legislation, but then the effect is wider and more lasting. And if I may just add this, sometimes, as we saw with single-use plastics, it can be really quick. And the effects of this directive are already visible. Thank you. Yes, uh, there with single-use plastics, we really can see how fast actually the changes can be made and what an input, a, impact can be done. But uh, what, according to your knowledge, could be the major knowledge gaps on microplastics right now, if we talk about the source of pathways and technologies? Maybe I start now from ladies' side, Valeria and Monica. Uh, what you would call the biggest gaps in knowledge right now and in which field? Mm -hmm. First, <laughs> Monica, please. Uh, it's a difficult question, I must say. Uh, I think that the, the, the biggest gap is that we still don't have the unified uh, monitoring uh, methodology. I mean uh, that while uh, detecting microplastics or its impact, uh, most of the institutions uh, and uh, researchers, they are, um, they, they are, they have their own um, method, and uh, which makes uh, gives such effect that we cannot compare the results. So uh, we finally we really don't know uh, the real, real facts about the situation. 
so I think this is the gap that should be very quickly filled in because then then we our knowledge is we have to base our knowledge on the real results and comparable results so uh, as long as we don't have uh, the the unified methodology we cannot compare uh, compare the results and we really don't know if this amount of microplastics found somewhere it is really high or low as compared to the other element of the environment but in general the things that we can find in storm water or wastewater do you see that if you don't talk about concentrations in general are having huge gaps there uh, i wouldn't uh, say so uh, because uh, as i said uh, if speaking about the wastewater treatment plant uh, the efficiency is quite uh, high and we only have to remember about the sewage sludge with, uh, which in Gdańsk is incinerated, mm -hmm. then it is not a problem. Um, uh, it, is, so it is only the willingness of the owners of the plants to, to monitor the situation and to raise awareness of, of the uh, residents because as we know, uh, most of the um, uh, microplastic that comes to the wastewater treatment plant is uh, uh, its source is the washing of uh, synthetic textiles. So we should increase the knowledge about the, uh, these facts and uh, insist uh, or convince the people to, to use uh, um, other kind of uh, clothes, uh, not uh, the textile ones, of course, whenever it is possible. Thank you, Valeri. You want to add something about the gaps? Uh, yes, uh, I can say many, many things different, but uh, I see three main gaps uh, in uh, the microplastic pollution knowledge. First of all, it's of course monitoring. Not every everyone can monitor uh, microplastic until now, and uh, uh, this is uh, yes the main uh, reason why to, why we don't know the correct relevant data from from every country, every organization. So. Uh, only few organizations can make some sampling and uh, analysis and uh, make some uh, attempts to monitor microplastics. The second one um, is uh, we still uh, doesn't have any information, proven information on uh, microplastic effect uh, to the living organisms still. Yes, we know that some uh, fishes eat microplastic and we can e eat uh, the microplastics with their food but how it will be effect on us on our organisms we still doesn't doesn't know don't know this proven uh, official de data we we don't have them and the and the last point uh, now uh, all research as i see uh, focused mainly on water water environment but what uh, about soils? What about atmospheric transferring? And uh, um, in case of uh, water treatment plant, yes, we will. Uh, there are data, impressive, impressive data that many uh, particles will be uh, removed by uh, active sludge, for example. Yes, but uh, this active sludge becomes sewage sludge, and uh, after somewhere it will be land feeling somewhere it be, it will be incinerating and uh, as a result the microplastic will be uh, again released to the environment somehow it's a fact we don't have uh, any circular model until now but may maybe we have but i don't know such so there are three points from my opinion <laughs> Thank you. I have a question to yes. In which areas we need to increase the research activities if you talk about the microplastics, maybe which areas or fields you would uh, prioritize? It depends on which answers you, which, which questions you want to answer. Because if you ask a question about human exposure, you would want, want one thing to be answered. If it is protecting the marine environment, it's another thing. Is it the terrestrial environment and so on? So with, with, without asking these questions, um, the, the end user driven resource, research, it's, 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 it can be many things, right? Uh, in, terms of, in terms of my personal interests, which might not be of your you interest, of course, I'm very interested in the degradation 
<clears throat> of the plastics because plastics uh, are not inert out there. The story about the bottle that floats in the sea for 400 years is um, rubbish, basically, because it doesn't survive that long if it's swimming on the surface of the sea. But if you dig it into the sediments of the ocean, it will definitely be there for many, 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 many unknown years. And uh, this also leads to uh, where you probably get the, the hotspots again, which is also then really interesting because if you can, if you, sorry, if I take the marine environment, where you will find the hotspots is in the sediments because that's where everything ends up and where you can find quite high concentration mm. actually. And uh, yeah. So I mean, there are many, many answers to your question, Sandra. Uh, let's talk about what can be done to reduce uh, this uh, amount of microplastics on individual level and also policy level. So that's why about politics, I will start uh, from uh, Mikhail. From political perspective, how do you think? Do you say we have enough good instruments already and uh, actually we just need to take them in force much more seriously or we still are missing something very very important mm -hmm. from this policy perspective and if yes what you would call like this uh, i think we have um, enough um, uh, we have several instruments to address uh, uh, certain aspects but we certainly lack um, let's say focused instruments and this is why we're developing this um, for the unintentional microplastics and for the intentional microplastics um, and also in terms of monitoring that you mentioned uh, of filling uh, knowledge gaps we do have the marine strategy framework directive which, which requires monitoring and assessment but as other speakers said i mean for microplastics the information the information is really very scarce huh? and um, um, we certainly need to to link better the monitoring and assessment with the measures huh? to, to, to take the results uh, uh, on the ground or rather in the sea and um, see how they link with the measures that we have taken. But if I may just a comment on the previous question, where are the gaps and what can we do to fill them and so on? I agree with everybody who said that there are gaps in terms of uh, data collection and in terms of impacts uh, uh, on human health and, and the environment. But I, I would like to stress that we will never have all the, the data that we would ideally want or need. We already, although we miss a lot of data, we already have enough data and enough information to be able to decide that we do not want the microplastics out there. So this means that we have enough data to say we need to take action and we need to reduce the emissions. And of course, the data acquisition and enrichment will, will come in parallel. Thank you. So I heard that we have already a lot, but still always we have way to improve. Uh, did some of you want to comment something on this? Because it seemed that uh, you, yes, you didn't had so many comment, no? Okay, so I misunderstood maybe your, your expression, but um, do we have something that we can say, uh, we, the rest of Europe or I don't know other regions can learn from Baltic Sea what has done now here, even with this fun plastic, maybe results what we've heard already in previous uh, sessions. Uh, and then vice versa, of course, can we learn something from other regions to improve situations right here? Uh, if we end with the politics, maybe start as well. Michael, maybe you can now uh, continue your thought about the political level. Is it something that we can learn from other regions or can other regions learn from Baltic Sea? Uh, yes, very briefly. Look, uh, I can tell you that um, uh, the Baltic Sea and Helcom uh, are often mentioned as examples. Huh? Uh, I'm not saying this to flatter you, but I mean, for many issues related to the marine environment in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of let's say, a uh, variety of measures, in terms of effectiveness of measures, in terms of organization, of governance, so to speak. I mean, uh, the Baltic Sea is given as an example. And I, I have no reason at all to contest this, uh, this assessment. But in the area of microplastics, as other speakers have already underlined, we're still in, this, in a starting phase. Huh? So it is difficult to say, although, of course, uh, uh, 
Farm Plastic uh, is, a, is a very good example of, uh, of uh, innovation and, and progress in terms of uh, knowledge acquisition and, and, and uh, implementation. Um, I think we are still in an, at the early stages of development in terms of microplastics, data collection, impact evaluation, uh, measures, effectiveness of measures, and so on and so forth. So, and some, uh, I would say that all the regions and, and even at EU level, we are starting now. Huh? So in my view, uh, um, a more, how shall I say, um, a useful question is uh, how we can at this stage avoid overlaps and avoid unnecessary duplication of effort. Huh? Uh, we have common questions, we have common problems, and I think the best way to address them is through a joint and uh, if you want my opinion, the joint EU framework in the context of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which, as I said, brings together in its technical group, formal and leader, the best national experts and the regional conventions. And uh, this is where we are trying to harmonize, to, to, to select the, the best possible, let's say, approaches. I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I know that you want to comment. And also, I wanted to ask you the same question here. Yeah, because because I, I, I agree very much because, uh, because uh, I think people have to uh, also see that researchers do research because they are researchers and want research outcomes. But the EU uh, wants to monitor for other purposes. And when you want to monitor, you have to, uh, to approach the problem in one way. It has to be comparable. It has to be systematic. It has to be over long term. When you're doing research, you want to find new things, do things nobody else has been doing, uh, look deep into, into a certain corner of it, see if that carries goes in, in a direction which is interesting and so on. And you typically also have shorter perspectives due to the funding uh, regime for, for research, which is typically some years. So, so you, in order to drive this, you must have a, a, an umbrella um, uh, organization or a system that, that leads uh, the, the effort in a joint way, in a harmonized way. And that cannot be the researchers. In, it, it's, it's the nature of things. Uh, thank you. Uh, about what we can learn and what others can learn from the region, maybe Valeria, you can as well uh, have some idea to share with us. How do you think? But my main opinion, and it is not only about microplastic pollution, but um, the Baltic Sea is um, one of the more uh, populated area, yes, and uh, uh, the, uh, it is a good example, our region, uh, of common actions of uh, all countries. And uh, in case um, for, for us, we are not a uh, United uh, Union country, Russia, yes, but uh, in any way, uh, many of our activities also uh, going through com compare with uh, European actions, different. And our we have our own legislations, but uh, in many times, I see that we are, in any cases, we are compare our actions, our legislations, how, uh, for example, how in Europe it's going on and how here. And uh, in, many, um, in many points, we have the same uh, ways going and the same um, management uh, rules, tools, or how can I say? So... Um, so uh, I see. I think it's my common opinion. I lost a little bit my mind. Uh, the Baltic Sea region is a good example of joint actions of all countries living uh, located here, and uh, it is a more effective way to better management and achieve uh, well-being soon sooner, as we are uh, action by se separate separate way. Uh, thank you, Monica. Would you like to add something from technical and wastewater treatment plant perspective about the joined and harmonized system? <laughs> have or don't have around? Um, I would rather not focus on on, uh, on uh, wastewater treatment plants, but generally speaking, the point is not to learn one from another, because as uh, it was said, uh, as Valeria said, uh, we are very active in this Baltic Sea area. 
but in uh, my uh, opinion, it is the point of exchanging uh, information and experiences. And it doesn't matter if it is the, uh, these are the Baltic Sea countries or other countries. We have to cooperate and uh, many different parties and stakeholders and companies should be involved because then we can uh, have uh, the visible results in the form of uh, uh, regulations, um, rising awareness activities and development of, of the wastewater treatment plants or other plants that are uh, cleaning the different elements of the environment. So I would say yeah, these words. So I now want to give a floor also to the questions that come from our audience and listeners and viewers. And uh, first question from Thomas, we have to, yes. So could yes, maybe provide an estimate of the cost of a uh, national monitoring program based on his experience from the analytical perspective. So how about the costs, please? Yeah, I mean, you're asking for what is the price of a car? Uh, <laughs> so you can, you can get it from very little up to very expensive. And uh, I mean, we do in, in going to Denmark, we have uh, the EPA is doing a, a, in the marine strategic program, they are monitoring and they are doing it via the sediments and they're using, using our lab for it. And uh, this is probably sort of, if I say so, in terms of costs, at least the Rice Rice, because, because uh, it, it costs about, um, uh, what is it? Uh, 4,000 euros per sample or something like that to, to analyze a sample like that. You, uh, this means you can go down to very small sizes. You have a very high, um, have a very high uh, uh, resolution and so on and so on and so on. If you, if you want to go for, for, uh, for, for cheaper approaches, you can, of course, also do that. But you will never get down to like 100 euros per sample or something like that. Forget it. It's not going to happen. Uh, or at least if, if it is going to happen, you are using some surrogate method. For example, now you could maybe use uh, one uh, method to analyze one plastic item, <coughs> polymer type, and then you extrapolate it to the rest of the plastic types, for example, which in terms of monitoring might be fully sufficient, by the way. So, 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 so I think it's, it's, it's unfortunately not an easy question to answer. Um, it's like what is the price of a car? Yeah, thank you. The next question is to Monica from Paul. Uh, how could you increase uh, cooperation with the business stakeholders? Um, it is difficult for me to uh, answer your questions as I am not a technical specialist and I am not working at the wastewater treatment plant, as a matter of fact. I am more involved in the rising awareness uh, and education uh, activities. Uh, but of course, there are many associations uh, that uh, can be joined by any business uh, or any company. For example, if speaking about uh, the wastewater treatment, we have uh, at least uh, two very important associations in Poland, but there are also like uh, uh, IWA, uh, very active uh, association working in different fields regarding the wastewater treatment. Uh, so um, if there is a possibility to join such an association and to exchange the information, uh, this is uh, the way to, to increase this business activity and to find the solutions that perhaps some other companies already have and uh, within the associations uh, attending different uh, seminars or conferences, you can get to know and get in co contact with those uh, other companies to get to know how to provide or uh, implement such a solution. Uh, the next question we have from Sama, and it's not um, directly after none of you, but I think that uh, maybe from Michael, I would expect first uh, answer. How to persuade plastic manufacturers to stop or reduce the production? What alternatives can be used by such manufacturer to reduce plastic production? So maybe from policy perspective, what would be your tools to say how to, uh, how to motivate them? Um, let me see first if I understood the question well. Uh, 
uh, what will the plastics producers produce if they have to produce less plastic? Is that the question? I understood the same way. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is, uh, I'm not a businessman, you know, eh? but I mean, uh, I think, uh, as yes, said, another uh, uh, panelist said, I mean, plastic uh, is, a, is a valuable material. Eh? And um, uh, I, um, there are also some, how shall I say, corporate uh, secrets, if I may put it that way. So the plastics industry knows much better than anybody uh, who draws information from, from public sources. They know much, much better what they produce, how much it costs, how they can diversify, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I'm sure that, uh, I mean, the, the plastic producers will not go bankrupt if uh, the single-use plastics uh, consumption is reduced. Huh? They will find ways to, to um, it's, it's a very, uh, let's say, strong industry, very diversified, very innovative. And I'm, I'm certain that they will find ways to, uh, um, to cope. Um, and I would also like to say that uh, what we do in, in, in Europe, but not only in Europe, I, I was listening to the Russian colleague very well. It's not only about Europe, we're talking about the region now. Huh? So uh, developing environmentally friendly and competitive products and materials is a, a competitive advantage for, for industries. And uh, I, the, the concerns and the problems are worldwide. So if we manage uh, to, 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 to stimulate the plastic producers and the products producers to, uh, to, to design and to, uh, to give us better products, I think at the end of the day, it will be for their benefit, also economic benefit. Thank you. Yeah, the next question is from Mitra. If you could write the next EU research call, which would be the main points it would contain to address microplastics in an efficient way? So I think this is question also to you. Do I need to repeat the question? Uh, to me, again, if I were to write the, the, the new... Uh, EU uh, research call, which would be yeah. the key point? Look, th th there are already, I mean, uh, um, topics about microplastics uh, in, in the, I don't know them by heart, of course, but uh, uh, I think from this point of view, the, 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 the research program covers um, quite well, but maybe yes has something to say also about that. Uh, he's a researcher, he's a scientist, uh, but I think it's now the awareness of microplastics is, is there. And not only the awareness, but also the policy documents, because you know probably that um, EU research funding has to be, let's say, compatible or support the EU policy uh, objectives, uh, uh, which is normal. Um, so, so the microplastics, which are now, let's say, included in all these policy documents that we discussed earlier, have also the role in, in research. So from your answer, I hear that it's already enough strongly. Yeah, I think so, yes. Calls. Yes, but maybe you have something to add or comment about the researcher part of you. No, I mean, it, it is definitely, as Mikhail said, it is definitely included. I mean, there have been several topics on microplastics in the recent, in the recent calls, and there will continue to be so. I mean, if you ask me if I want more, <laughs> Right, you will always get the same, same question, same answer. Right, of course I want more, but uh, the EU also have to balance the research uh, overall. Right, so it is, it is, it is a balance. The policy it is strongly in the policy, which uh, makes me quite certain that it will continue to get funded also. So, so, so uh, I think it's appropriate, adequate, or good, or whatever. Fine. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Maybe next question would go to Valeria. Uh, what can each of us do at the individual level to help tackle the microplastics issue? And do you have any positive examples of activities conducted to reduce the problem? And sometimes we hear that actually consumers do not have a choice because you choose something that is kind of without the microplastics you anyway, and up having products uh, releasing microplastics in the environment. Would you have any positive examples on, on which we could? Maybe turn on. Yeah, by the way, I have a lot of positive uh, examples. First of all, I saw the questions according to the clothes uh, at our chat. Is it it? 
Uh, it, is, uh, it is partly related because we don't have so much time to go through all okay. of them. And the question yes. is really, really long, but uh, that's why I mentioned this possibility to choose another option for customer. Yes. Okay. So, of course, uh, many, many uh, things here is uh, people choice, first of all. Uh, it's a question of what we will choose in different uh, situations. For instance, for with the clothes, we cannot uh, prevent uh, or stop uh, pro producing of uh, uh, clothes with uh, plastic and contamination because uh, the plastic fibers gives a positive, uh, uh, positive uh, how can I explain? The clothes is not deformed so much. For, for example, this, uh, we, we need to move for more long fashion. It's called, I, I think it's called long fashion. So we need to use our goods uh, as more as possible. And we not uh, uh, go buy uh, any jacket and uh, take it away from after one year, for instance. In case of single use plastic product, it's of course, uh, we can choose use it or not. Uh, in case of cosmetics, of course, we can uh, search and uh, read first, read please ingredients and contents of cosmetics you are using. Yes, it's, uh, rules is quite simple, by the way. Uh, according to the washing machines, even uh, uh, in Russia, we don't have so much laundry and it's not so popular here. And uh, uh, we also don't know don't know when uh, the special filters will be developed for them. So simple using like uh, be more careful with clothes, for example. So, but here are the different uh, little steps. Many little steps we will uh, uh, moving us to the positive changes. And for example, uh, I, I prepared one example in Kaliningrad. We have a. Uh, from uh, 2020, we become it's become ex started the experiment of separate waste collecting has started in Kaliningrad in only in municipal level, and uh, uh, for uh, 30, 30 months we collected uh, around uh, 100 tons of uh, resources, not wastes already. It is resources already, and uh, we see the people are really ready for them because uh, our Companies uh, informed us that uh, the trash of the uh, in the uh, containers were only twenty percent. So it was a really good selected wastes or resources. We try to avoid. So and of course, uh, only one issue we will not um, prevent is producing some medicine uh, medicine items from plastic because. They are really valuable for our lives. Like we 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 will not able to prevent it fully. I think so. It's from my side. I think yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, we will hear from you and also yeah from uh, Valerie and Monica will be also presented after fifteen minutes. Uh, the communication activities uh, and uh, they will I think hear more about everything you already mentioned. But let me. Uh, finish this discussion with very, very short answer to the question for each of you. How do you see the future of the Baltic Sea in five or 10 years when it comes to the microplastic pollution? Will you be towards more positive or pessimistic and negative point of view? Yes, I will start with you. Again, I think, I think it's very encouraging that uh, there is a joint effort. And, and this joint effort is around the whole Baltic Sea. And uh, there is this focus which is on it will it may mean that in the long term it will become better than it is. It will improve. Yes, thank you for your positive way of thinking and, <laughs> and encouraging. Uh, uh, Michael, how was your... Um, I will be very short. I agree with yes. I think it will be better. Again, I think it will be much better in terms of reduction of emissions. We don't know how much better it will be in terms of quality of the marine environment. And I would like to add that the Baltic Sea and Helcom have already proven that they can, in, with eutrophication, they have already proven that they can design and implement the necessary effective measures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Valerie? Um, I, uh, I am positive uh, opinion. I, I expect uh, more technologies will be 
uh, implemented and uh, tested, I think uh, more scientists uh, involved to the common work, joint efforts to uh, to achieve good results. So I am only uh, I'm thinking only about positive changes now, <laughs> and I hope so. I hope also for people's behavior changes. And uh, Monica, your final positive or pessimistic negative way of uh, seeing this Baltic Sea microplastic issue in five or ten years. Um, I am a positive person, uh, but if coming back to the situation with the Baltic Sea, it seems to be dark But uh, at the moment. But I think it can be brighter or even light if we don't stop our uh, activities and don't stop uh, to run the project like uh, this one, uh, because then we when acting together, we can really achieve the results. And I hope, as other said, I hope that the situation will be better. Hopefully, you're also positive persons. And uh, really, but as you said, even if we have data and data says that maybe the situation is dark, as you mentioned, with the joint efforts, we can hopefully uh, make it better. So about the concrete uh, also activities uh, based on raising awareness activities, we'll continue in 10 minutes, but now I would like to thank you all for this discussion and answering all these questions. And sorry for the questions that stayed unanswered, but uh, we have them in written form. So probably we have the context from the people who send them and we can still um, continue this uh, discussion in written form later on. Thank you so much once again and see you in 10 minutes. So welcome back to the last part of today's conference. And in this part, we will focus on communication activities. Some of them were carried out during this project and some of them are still happening or will be seen, still seen in the nearest future. And as a first speaker, I would like to invite here back Valeria Zagirova from the Environment Center ECAT perspective to tell us more. So Valeria, I think you have now the floor, which is yours. Please go on. Oh, yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank all of participants for joining to our final conference. So I'm, I think I'm ready to share my screen. So uh, about our communication campaigns during the project, I name it, I call it learning from COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as our project has started in nine, two, uh, 2019, uh, of course, we were able, able to organize uh, events, uh, clean up campaigns, and face-to-face uh, -face meetings from the start of the project. And one of them were uh, the clean games uh, near the Neman River. And it was quite a good uh, and big uh, events, uh, which involved around more than 100 participants. So we involved 10 sponsors and partners there. And it was a really good, uh, great events where we collected around tons of uh, weights and we collected it separately. Uh, but uh, as we all know, uh, 2020, in 2020, we faced uh, one uh, common big challenge is uh, global lockdown. Uh, but um, within this lockdown, we needed to continue our informational campaigns uh, within the project and uh, we needed to disseminate information on the project and so on so on and uh, as uh, all people i've spent a lot of time at home <laughs> uh, and uh, looked uh, for our friends and the people i know what they're doing at homes and uh, the idea of uh, creating the board game has come has came um, and uh, the game which uh, where it will be uh, when uh, the game uh, will uh, aimed to attract attention to the problem of microplastic and uh, create common understanding of uh, this pollution on this challenge. Uh, the principal moment during the development, it was uh, attention to the project, uh, no plastic in the content. So figures and boxes are made from wood. Uh, the questions related to microplastic pollution and plastic pollution. Uh, so the people can uh, can know uh, some new facts for them and uh, related mini games. Uh, for example, one of mini games calls uh, cosmetics, uh, where uh, 
person uh, look at the card and uh, should uh, read the ingredients of the cosmetics and uh, decide it, uh, is there a microplastic in contaminants or not. Uh, of course, the attention to the sources and the measures to reduce uh, pollution and uh, attention to the Baltic Sea region. As you see, the main uh, gaming fields made uh, in the form of a map of our region. The game content you can see on the left side of the slide. Uh, before the creating of, uh, of the board game, of course, we have uh, a lot of discussions internally and with some of our project partners, if th this idea will be good for our project or not. But at, uh, at the final stage, we, we have this board game now. Uh, so uh, about the process of creation, it took around six months for creation, three, four, uh, th three months uh, for the content of the game and uh, around three months for uh, tests and uh, corrections. Totally, uh, it was uh, around 20 gaming sessions, test sessions we game with uh, uh, students, uh, few, we tested the game with students, pupils, with our relatives, with our friends, around, uh, we involved around, <laughs> around three, uh, 30 participants and made uh, four or five corrections of the game. Uh, until we get the uh, evaluation more than four points from five. And the 5th of July, uh, we've got the first uh, game ready and uh, the disseminated strategy has started. So we choose uh, only several channels as promotion through different channels uh, like social networks, social media, TV channel, participation in different kinds of events as a partner, sponsors, uh, and to uh, gift, uh, gift the game to the target organizations, which uh, involves to the education, uh, environmental education purposes or activities. So you can see we created two um, pages in Instagram. So uh, the people who already get the game can um, make some uh, link for uh, on us and uh, everyone who wants to test the game also can uh, write can write us and make some requests for the game also. So um, uh, for now, with our informational campaign, you can see on the slide uh, around seven, uh, 17 organizations which uh, have uh, the game now. And we're proud to say that uh, if uh, our, our tools, our game were development mainly for uh, citizens, for a wide audience, but we were able to involve also authorities uh, and state governmental authorities like Ministry on Natural Resources of Russian Federation and uh, Committee for Natural Resources uh, of, of the St. Petersburg. And we, we have already get some uh, positive uh, feedbacks on the game and they, are, they would like to use it uh, for educational purposes also. And um, now we are uh, after the game of creating the game, uh, we become we came to the situation when uh, uh, not we request for the uh, some events for organizing events, but the people who organize something or, and organizations they are requested uh, for us and asking us to participate or present the fun plastic project or to provide many lectures on microplastic pollution, so on and so on. Uh, and uh, from the July, yes, from the July, uh, more than or already more than nine uh, events were uh, held with our participation and, of course, with pre presentation of our project. So a little bit about the uh, events. First of all, uh, it was a plastic-free July campaign uh, organized by uh, our organization and supported by Ecospace Green Cat in Kalingrut region. So. Um, it was competition in uh, uh, Instagram. It wasn't uh, published in Instagram. So we gifted the board game for the separately collected wastes. Of course, with some requir requirements for the participants. And you can see um, after the July finished, we uh, gifted the games to the just people who uh, who uh, collect uh, collect the waste separately and brings to the Ecospace uh, Green Cat. The next one uh, 
we joined to the envir international environmental quest on the planet. It was a final stage of the quest where the winners from different regions of Russian Federation uh, joined and uh, had the final quiz. Of course, we provide the mini lecture about microplastic pollution and uh, about our project. Uh, and of course, special question for participants for and for the right answers, they got uh, a game. So three, three winners, uh, if I remember well. Uh, the next one is a great big event uh, where held in uh, St. Petersburg is a international cleanup campaign, Clean Beach organized by uh, government of St. Petersburg. So there we also provide mini lecture about uh, microplastic pollution. Uh, link it with lecture, of course, we'll link it with uh, sustainable development goals as well. And uh, we organized special interactive uh, for participants, plastic crocodile. Uh, it was a really difficult day for us because uh, you can see on the photo, there were a lot of participants and uh, uh, me and my colleague, uh, we repeated uh, the same information more than 26 times. <laughs> and uh, the next one, um, is uh, we organized fun plastic sea session during visa water project uh, training for expert in water resource management and uh, i can say it was a unique opportunity to discuss microplastic pollution directly with the experts and uh, ask their opinion on it on different technologies um, our present uh, our present of fun plastic project was were focused on the pilots uh, so our experts will be able and aware about possible solutions for micro microplastic removal uh, and of course we presented a board game uh, ask it if they will uh, need some information support from the project or they would like to uh, give us some uh, comments feedbacks uh, they are very welcome and of course discussion we, we will help and uh, uh, in September, uh, it was a great event in Kaliningrad region, um, opening the Waste Art Museum in Kaliningrad um, on the uh, Ecospace Green Cat, where we also provide the uh, mini lecture in format of TEDx, if you know this, and a special interactive for participants, microplastic in cosmetics. As you see on the photo, we offered the participants, just people who came to the museum, uh, look at the cosmetics uh, through the microscopes. And uh, they saw some colored microplastic particles. And uh, it was really popular place, interactive place in, in this event, I can say. Uh, and uh, of course we provide uh, uh, information and uh, a different kind of events. Someone uh, asked us about um, organized gaming session, for instance, with students, uh, or just to present the game. Uh, and now, uh, after our social campaigns, uh, and not only social, as a result, we've got a lot of uh, people who are interested in, in results in from plastic project also. For example, the last our last partner meetings were in October and when I put it, uh, some information in my uh, page on social network, uh, next 15 minutes I have got some requests like, oh, I would like to know the results of sampling, please provide us the results. So um, I can say that we achieved our goals, we attract to attention to the microplastic pollution, to the, our project, and uh, this is why I, uh, during the, our panel discussion, I was quite a positive, uh, positive uh, person for the further development of uh, this issue. Uh, so, and uh, I think this is enough for me. Thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, any questions, you are welcome to answer. Ask, ask me. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Valeria, uh, for your presentation. For a while, we don't have questions to you, but as always, they might come a bit later. But I think Monica can slightly actually continue your topic because of the communication activities. I know that in this fun plastic project, she also has a lot of interesting to show us as well. Please, Monica. Yeah. OK. 
Okay. Mm. Do you see the presentation? Okay. Now it should be okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for giving me the possibility to give this presentation. I will start with the rising awareness activities that were provided by the company that I work in, uh, Gnice Water Utilities, and I will show the range of possibilities. But I also will um, say a few words about the activities uh, undertaken by other uh, project partners. And uh, finally, I will give the floor to Daiva to present Microplastic Alliance. Uh, we um, run our campaign uh, under the slogan City on Detox. It is uh, the campaign that uh, initiated in 2017 as a part of Nonha City project we were participating. And Nonha City project refers to hazardous substances that can be found in different everyday life uh, products, including plastics. Therefore, we uh, connected those two projects. And what is this connection? Uh, microplastic is everywhere, like hazardous substances are. Uh, plastic and microplastics seems to be the most significant source of harmful endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, which can uh, impact uh, the human health. And plastics in most cases, like the hazardous substances, uh, are visi invisible to the naked eye and plastic which degrades to microplastics as well as hazardous substances should be eliminated at the source. And therefore we are running with rising awareness campaigns. campaigns. Um, we wanted, in our campaign, we wanted to reach uh, the broader audience. So we started with the youngest. Uh, uh, I had the presentation, bad textiles for pupils, fifth graders at the Helios Cinema. And it was to emphasize the problem of fast fashion, uh, but also the fact that the washing of synthetic textiles is the main source of microplastic pollution. Uh, for the campaign, we also use our cyclic events uh, like the celebration of World Water Day. And in uh, 2020, uh, we started the campaign uh, Morze bez plastiku, which has a double meaning, uh, depending how you write this word Morze, uh, because one, me one meaning is um, uh, maybe without plastic and the other uh, the sea without plastic. And uh, because uh, the, the campaign was seated in social media uh, because of the lockdown, uh, we were trying to show microplastic in numbers. And also within the small campaign, we organized the Decode the Plastic uh, competition on Facebook, uh, in which uh, people are, were asked to, to uh, recognize a kind of plastics, a kind of polymer basing on recycling codes. And we received 100 submissions. So this, this is the poster of the campaign with the numbers and the photo of uh, microplastic. Uh, the other possibility to reach the audience is just uh, the public speaking. And I had the possibility to take part in the debate, not bad climate and what sh should we do about it? It was organized on the 40th uh, anniversary of August agreements in Poland. And I was talking about the impact of micropollutants, generally speaking, on the climate change. Uh, the other possibility for the campaign is uh, the use of the public space. And um, uh, we had the exhibition with art provoking posters prepared under the slogan, plastic is not fantastic. Uh, the, the posters were prepared by the students of the fine art. And uh, the, uh, the exhibition was seated in the gallery space of two shopping centers in Gdańsk. And thanks to this, we uh, could raise ecological awareness, not only of customers, but also uh, of the shops uh, owners and the gastronomy sector, as in, in the galleries, there are a lot of restaurants and cafes. Uh, together with the first uh, exhibition, we also organized the workshop, uh, the code, the plastics, and the, this is the same name as the competition that I have already mentioned. 
And the workshop was to um, help people to recognize different kinds of plastics basing on recycling codes, and uh, they also uh, get to know how to separate them. Uh, within the campaign and our rising awareness activities, we also wanted to explain uh, and show the sampling procedure that was used for, for the project and analytical methods. So we, re we recorded uh, two uh, movies on uh, the sampling uh, procedure and uh, together with the article on the, on the analytical methods and uh, also about the universal filtering object device, uh, they, uh, the, this article and the movies uh, were placed on, uh, uh, on the uh, website. If speaking about competitions, uh, they can be organized within or besides the social media. And for this reason, we use our uh, cyclic uh, competition, Why Water and Sewer Systems uh, Don't Like Waste. It is organized uh, since uh, six, seven years now uh, to celebrate clean up the world action. Uh, and every year we give uh, the participants different tasks. So in 2020, uh, we asked them to prepare posters with microplastic problem message. And the winner posters were used uh, for the social campaign in Gdańsk on the city lights uh, at bus shelters. And they were hung uh, on the celebration of World Water Day uh, 2021. Uh, in uh, the 2021 edition, we asked the, the participants uh, to prepare to write a story uh, on an ecological problem, starting with the sentence, once upon a time in Europe, unexpected problem occurred. Uh, the competition is still ongoing, but we received all the stories and we realized that uh, in many cases, microplastic uh, problem is underlined. Um, the winner prom, uh, posters from 2020, we also decide to, to place them on the education boards at the seaside recreation area. Uh, as we have uh, quite a lot of these boards, we also use them, some of them for, uh, for the campaign uh, uh, regarding uh, cigarette butts, because we know that this is the major source of uh, cellulose acetate uh, that is released to stormwaters. And uh, within this campaign, we were trying to uh, draw attention to inappropriate smokers' behavior when getting rid of the butts. And the slogan on the poster says, don't let uh, the micro microplastics uh, from butts uh, to end up uh, in your buffet, just drop it to the waste bin. Uh, as we all know, social media is really unlimited potential of uh, knowledge dissemination. So uh, we also, during our within our activities, we use uh, the City on D Detox uh, Facebook uh, profile and Instagram profile. But we also were trying to follow the trends. So one of the small campaigns, Dotsen uh, Wode, which means appreciate and value the water. We seated this campaign in TikTok and it was organized within our education pro program, uh, Hydro Mission. Uh, for, the, for the project purpose, we also contracted the uh, ambassador. Uh, this is um, uh, the very well known uh, press and TV uh, journalist, uh, very well known in Poland, Katarzyna Bosacka. She has her own uh, TV program on a national uh, TV channel, but also the program uh, uh, in the internet, uh, in social media. And we plan uh, planned to, to record three movies on a micro microplastic problem. Two of them uh, had been already uh, published. It is microplastic macro problem and 10 eco gadgets for a penny. And the last one, uh, which is going to present uh, project results and, and the conclusions, it is uh, under preparation and should be released at the very end of December. And now I will try to <clears throat> say a few words about what other partners did. And I will start with Dine Squatters and Magojata and her team. Uh, I asked the partners to <clears throat> prepare for me the top of the tops activities, and this is one of, of them. 
uh, Dance Quarters prepared educational quiz uh, on the celebration of World Water Day. And it was to verify the knowledge about the interesting and full of adventurous travel of the storm water in Gdańsk that begins in the sky and can end in the Baltic Sea. Uh, the winners of the quiz uh, who managed to get the, uh, the, uh, the biggest amount of points, they received the cotton bag and the stainless steel water bottle. And in the quiz uh, took uh, part uh, 900 participants. And uh, the quiz was to underline the importance of uh, the ensuring the stormwater quality and uh, as Małgorzata told me, some teachers use the quiz as a part of their online lessons. The other one uh, that I like uh, uh, the most, uh, these are the special graphics created uh, with ecological paint, and they appeared on uh, pavements near 18 road trains and two retention uh, reservoirs in Gdańsk. Uh, and um, they are very brand new because the, the, the graphics were created in September uh, this year. Uh, and they show several types of waste, such as cigarette butts, plastic bags, plastic bottles, straw, and so on. Uh, and they are falling on the on these gra uh, graphics, they are falling into a road drain, and the real uh, road drain, as you can see on the on the photos. And above the drain, there is a painted image of a plate with a fish that was swallowed, uh, that has swallowed the waste, uh, and it uh, has a slogan from the street to your plate. But in some places, uh, you can uh, other graphics were used with a um, painted seagull or a seal with a stomach full of plastic waste. And there were slogans like from your street to the environment, from your street to aquatic animals, or from your street to birds' stomachs. And uh, this is uh, Dice Quarter prepared also the mobile information boards that are traveling across the street and taking part in the city events uh, during music festivals or running events. And uh, they are very, they are not only uh, to disseminate some certain information, but also can be used as a furniture. So you can sit on it, take a sun bath, and uh, during some event, they were placed on the beach. And now it's the time for Luke uh, and Marietta and her team. And they wanted to <clears throat> emphasize uh, the, the biggest uh, event, uh, which was the Deep Microplastic Challenge. It was a week-long hackathon, <clears throat> and it aimed to creating new, new innovative solutions, sustainable services, and business concepts to prevent microplastic from entering the Baltic Sea. It was organized by Luke, but also by Helsinki Think Company. And it uh, took place uh, in turn of November and December uh, uh, 2019. Uh, the event brought together about 40 participants from different branches, uh, different institutions, and with uh, different uh, pro professions. The winning team focused on plastic fibers uh, that detach from clothes during washing. And the solution was uh, a filter that clears the water from microplastics and can be attached to any washing machine. And we hope uh, this filter will soon uh, be available on, on the market. And another activity um, uh, related to the pilot uh, prepared by Luca in Kuvola. Uh, the, this pilot was finally promoted, and in uh, April this year, a press release on this pilot was published by the city of Kovola. And the press release uh, created a lively interest in this experiment, and soon the filter construction was introduced in the morning show on national TV channel. It also resulted in stories in local and national newspapers and was shared on Twitter. Uh, also, additionally, an information board has been mounted uh, close to the uh, read pilot along the popular outdoor road to deliver information on the aims and the pilot and the fantastic uh, project to the local inhabitants. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, the salt and Johan and uh, his uh, partners, his team. Uh, as uh, we know, uh, salt was very much involved in the um, microplastic re release from uh, artificial uh, turfs. And uh, thanks to their work, um, Norwegian authorities developed a bill on the design and operation of sport fields using plastic loose filling material, which is a part of the Pollution Control Act. And this new bill entered into force the 1st July this year. Sorry, I didn't change the slide, but you will have a possibility still to, to have a look at it. Uh, so uh, the salt was very much engaged in the whole process uh, which brought uh, into force this bill and uh, uh, they were in uh, touch uh, with near, nearly 20 sport clubs and several municipalities who had the responsibility for the operation uh, of artificial turf uh, sport fields. They discussed the experience, uh, the, the leakage of rubber granulate uh, out of the fields <clears throat> and also uh, they were looking for alternative uh, in field materials uh, therefore they discussed um, they stayed i mean south stayed in contact with the major providers of artificial turf for sports fields in norway but also with the major researchers working on sustainability of football facilities in norway Norway, as well as with the Norwegian Football Association. And all these uh, discussions and, uh, and exchanging information and experiences brought into force this bill. Uh, when the bill uh, was already approved uh, and about to enter into force, SALT published the Chronicle uh, in the debate section of the major Nor Northern Norway regional newspaper and the chronicle include uh, the whole process and the description how uh, it was uh, how and what has been done to to get this uh, bill i wanted to say a few words about some new challenges that we have to face but i don't have too much time so maybe i should skip those slides uh, and uh, give the floor uh, to daiva Thank you for your attention. And Daiva, the floor is yours. If you want me to change the slides, please let me know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad to join your presentation. And please start from the first slide. Yeah, uh, I would like to present uh, our output of Wet Package 4. And uh, it is called <laughs> Microplastic Alliance. The alliance was formed uh, by efforts of all partners mm, during the last period of the project. The aim of, of this uh, uh, alliance is uh, to make it live after end of the project in the form of an uh, online visualization uh, of resources to understand and mitigate uh, microplastic pollution in the Baltic Sea. So it, it is mainly the list of relevant actors and stakeholders. <clears throat> and it was identified during the whole period of uh, project, firstly starting from stakeholders mapping, also involving uh, all kinds of association and partner organizations, uh, which are really involved and active in microplastic pollution. And uh, this interactive map uh, was uh, published and will be publicly available on the Fan Plastic uh, page, web page, project web page. Next slide, please. Uh, this is how it look like, uh, looks like. Mm, don't worry, it's in Lithuanian because it's Google map. Uh, so if any other person will open it, it will be in its own language. Uh, you can see icons of microplastic uh, organizations, active organizations and microplastic. Uh, second slide, please. Uh, and uh, if you click 
on the uh, right upper corner, you will see all uh, list of those organizations and uh, it is under categories. There are four of them, governmental bodies, academical institutions, water, wastewater and waste utilities, also NGOs and social uh, uh, interest, civil interest organizations. Uh, you can filter them, uh, as you see here, governmental bodies are seen. Next slide, please. Uh, and you can filter tickle two uh, kinds of institutions and you will see them. And of course, you can select uh, from the list one institution and uh, you will see the full information about it. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, it will come out like, you know, in, in Google Maps. So uh, we believe that this list and this communication network will live beyond the project and, and uh, be sustainable output of our project. So mm, that's all. Yeah, and, and this is the link where you can find this map. So it will be really an option to prolong our cooperation, to involve any other uh, organizations. And uh, you should, I should say that one more thing, that uh, this map is possible to change, to update, so it will be developed further. So thank you for your attention and just my thanks to all the team. It was really a pleasure and a good opportunity to have a um, possibility and financing of Secretariat to, to work in this team and create the results, really informative and useful results. Thank you. Yeah, also thank you from my side to all of you and to the Mike Dynsk team, the guys from my department that really helped me to, to prepare all those activities that I was talking about. So thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you, Daiva, and thank you, Monica, for your presentation. So we really have a lot of things that we heard today, and there are much more that was done, I think, during these three years. Uh, when fun plastic project activities were carried out in all different fields, starting from um, research and ending up with communication. And I think that everyone has its uh, take home message after today's conference, but let's put all things together. And um, I have prepared some of the slides like concluding remarks as answers to concrete questions and uh, that I can uh, share with you right now. So hopefully you see the presentation right now, right? So uh, we actually collected information from our speakers, uh, like answers on the concrete questions, like is it possible to tackle the microplastics? What can be done globally, regionally, and uh, in European level and national, and of course, local communities? Uh, to tackle this issue, uh, of course, I asked also this question during this uh, panel discussion, what we had, that um, what would be the force cost for the situation in the 10 years time for Baltic Sea and microplastics. Then the concrete question we asked, what would you change if you could? And there's interesting things uh, that we will see in the minute. And of course, we also asked about the policy things and about the documents. So we asked which of the three actions addressing microplastics in the Helcom Regional Action Plan on marine litter should be prioritized. And that also we got uh, concrete answers from our speakers. So let's see first about the uh, microplastics problem and how to tackle it. Uh, of course, we can hear it quite recently, uh, quite often that the problem was uh, actually realized only recently, comparing to others when we talk about the ecological problems in many different environments. But even though uh, we can actually significantly reduce micro microplastic pollution if we have this comprehensive approach, and it means we replace plastic materials whenever it's possible, 
We collect macro and microplastic litter at their origin. And finally, we remove microplastic along their pathways before they reach the sea. Um, also, of course, we can see that in principle, yes, we can tackle the problem, but it's long-term effort. So we need patient determination and integrated approach for this. Uh, also, it depends on the source or pathway of the microplastic. Some of the problems can be handled preventively, like bans or substitution of materials. But for others, we need different ways to control the pollution through the water treatment. And uh, we talked about the treatment. There are also some concrete solutions, uh, let's say prioritized. One is, of course, if we talk about advanced treatment technologies and wastewater treatment plants, but also these so-called nature-based solutions need to be kept in mind, like, for example, constructed wetland systems, and uh, that we have heard, of course, about the Gdańsk Municipal Wastewater Treatment Plan uh, and the, the activities that were carried out in the Fan Plastic Sea project. Also, of course, we need uh, sufficient information. The lack of information is one of the problems still, and the data is needed for further managing the problem, including legislative initiatives development. Uh, of course, our expert says mostly that if it's not possible to fully eliminate microplastics, uh, however, it is possible to minimize the emissions. And for that, we need joint efforts for academy, policymakers, businesses, and of course, community and raising awareness activities. So what we need to do globally, regionally, European, on the European level, nationally and locally. So changes in policies is one thing, and uh, we need to support more innovative solutions. So that's why supporting technology products and research and development is also an issue. Uh, of course, as, as communication, we heard as well, a lot of things need to be done to aware, uh, raise awareness and maybe to uh, have more activities in this field. Uh, we need more address source and pathways. Uh, we need more adequately do monitoring and aquatic environment and engage with stakeholders at all the appropriate levels. Uh, of course, there is also a very popular idea that everyone can do their part. So that's why local communities also can largely influence the implementing measures. And that's, for example, about the stormwater treatment or capturing granulated artificial turfs, what we heard as well lately, uh, is the thing that need to keep in mind when we are uh, doing these local level management actions. Uh, on the global scale, also thing that is needed, the ban on single use plastic, still development of public transport system. That's interesting example about the car tires that we heard. So maybe about the city just to minimize it it affects, we need to more uh, interact with other activities about the mobility and stuff like this. On local scale, uh, things that need to be done is more like buy plastic free cosmetics, use public transportation, as I mentioned before, buy clothes made from natural materials and change how we do the laundry. So basically everything that we usually connect to the uh, habits uh, and the way how we do things in our everyday life. And of course, it's very important to remember that we cannot live without plastic and that we heard already today as well several times, but we need to use plastic properly and minimize uncontrolled waste of it. Uh, so we need suitable regulations and we need, of course, knowledge and tips for consumers what can be done differently. Uh, about the communication, if we talk, of course, uh, there's also idea that business actually is willing to change and to reduce the use of plastic, uh, but uh, financial issues come over, so costs also need to be uh, considered. Uh, let's move to the next question that we had. How would you foresee the situation to be in the 10 years time in Baltic Sea? And there we have interesting, uh, actually, comparison. Like Greta Thunberg, when she started all the campaigns against the climate change, it was 2018, and actually only three years time made really big change what we can hear in media and all the societies in general, this pro and contra, what we liked or didn't like, but but these topics were actually in agenda. And that's why we can just ask what can happen in 10 years time. It's long enough time to 
tackle the macro and microplastic problem if there is enough political willingness and global collaboration. Um, of course, we need more implement uh, the already existing uh, instruments and policies, but we need, of course, to do better uh, to address these issues also in um, different uh, parts of in society and stakeholders. Uh, so there are things what need to be done, but we need to really be prepared that it's not simple and it's not easy. So also you can hear, uh, see here more in detail what would be the situation in um, 10 years time, but the short idea is that actually we need more practical initiatives also from top down uh, approach, not only to ask from society and from users or, or uh, people who let's stop to buy something or choose some other products, but actually we need more sustainable alternatives to uh, be available in the market. So suitable regulations and uh, removal technology, so technological part as well need to be um, improved. And of course, if in case nothing changes, the situation can be really difficult is one of the conclusion, but we need to do a lot and it is possible to do a lot if we do it together in all uh, levels, starting from local communities and ending with the global level. And of course, if it will not change, if we do not do, we will not do anything to change the problem in general. So the problem will become just bigger. So we need to keep in mind that every step matters. So, and then we asked our speakers, what would you change if you could? And then there are different things that come out, uh, like uh, tighten the requirement for car tires or ban the use of excess plastic, like in packaging, which is not necessarily needed. A uh, concrete uh, idea came up that snow treatment and banning direct dumping in urban snow to the sea is one thing that can be done and have huge impact. Uh, we need more and very rapidly pre enforce prevention measures on products, reinforce marine environment monitoring and assessment. So also need to have improvements in the waste management system and increased recycling of plastic materials. Uh, so actually, of course, we as well hear again and again that plastic is not the root of the problem, but actually the single use lifestyle we are having. So we need to change that. And to change that, we, of course, can uh, ask ourselves what exactly I can do to do this better. Uh, like, yes, yeah, speed up the legislative procedures, focusing on unifying the analytical methods. So again, we talk about the research, monitoring, and one idea is that what would be changed if it could be possible that increase the funding of research. Uh, so, and if about uh, concrete points of this uh, Helcom Regional Action Plan on marine litter, what should be prioritized? Our speakers actually talk about three things and exactly uh, RL7 so-called is the uh, priority number one. So you can see that most, most of the answers says that um, RL7 is the most comprehensive and promise clear synergies with the EU policies and is very, very important one. Also, secondly, we see RL9 as a point that need to be prior prioritized, but mostly it's RL7 that can actually bring the changes. So thank you very much. But at the very end of our conference, I would like to ask you a question again. And uh, uh, sorry, stop sharing my screen. Uh, and uh, the question will be again in our poll. So if we could have them right now uh, on the screen, the first question will be before I ask what you are going to change in your daily life after attending this conference, I would like to ask you who is the most relevant actor when tackling microplastics and there you can have options for your answers and for the options uh, we have like global instrument reg regional seas conventions EU regulation national regulation regulations or individuals so uh, let's see what do we have from your answers which uh, Yes, so as a global instrument and EU regulations and national regulations, 
just after second we had the same level now national regulations and eu regulations comes out as a as a first option so it seems that there are quite different opinions about the instruments uh, regional seas conventions are not very popular answer but for a while seems that yes eu regulations is something that you will tackle uh the first the second question um is uh, interesting what you would answer what you can do and change in your daily life after attending this conference and also here we give you some uh answers uh, options for answers so either drive more slowly and use the brakes less uh maybe avoid buying synthetic clothes maybe you will minimize the use of single-use plastic items or will not change anything. Also, this is an answer. So let's see what are your uh, what are your answers and what are you ready to change in your uh, daily life. So let's uh, have the results. Uh, yeah, of course, minimizing uh, single-use plastic items and avoid buying synthetic clothes are the most popular options uh, will not change anything also honest answer uh, oh someone will drive more slowly it's really interesting that some of you chose also this option but seems that minimizing the use of single-use plastic is the most popular and probably the easiest thing to do as we already heard many times today so thank you for taking part in this poll question and uh, thank you all for uh, taking active part in today's conference. I once again want to thank all speakers and uh, panelists before uh, who were present here. And uh, as I mentioned, hopefully that everyone has his own take home message and uh, some of you already mentioned from microplastics not to have the macro problem. We have really a lot of things to do. Thank you and have a nice afternoon and goodbye.